Tube. Welcome home. Be back. What's the deal? What's the vibes? We back. What's the vibes? Back again. What's up, the team there? Home team, assemble. Recording's now in progress for those who are not in the know. Been a long time. Yeah, man. Feel good to be home. Long time coming. Welcome to the Lives. We are live in in the studio. Back home. Fresh off a European tour. <laughs> Shout out to all the good folks of UK, all the good folks of France, um, Germany, Holland, Switzerland. Yeah. All of that, man. We got some rest. It Feels was good. A- it was good to be home. It was a it was a hell of a run, man. That was there was no seven to ten day run like that. So it's, it's always good to be back. Legendary vibes for sure. We, the last two market Mondays we recorded in London, so you know it was it was a tough strain on the situation. But we back we back on uh, American soil, back doing live Safely. live recordings market Mondays. A lot to talk about today. A lot to talk about today. Obviously, you know, we got everything going on with the war. Um, you know, the stock market just continues to fall. Mm-hmm. Uh, oil at all time highs. Yo, shout out to Jess. Yeah, yeah, yeah she said um, that. And we have a guest. We have a, we have an esteemed guest today that's going to be talking about the world of socially responsible investing, ETFs, mm-hmm. all of that stuff. So it is Women's Month. It's going to be a good one. Shout out to all the women out there. Shout out to all the women out all there. All our, our lady supporters. That's a fact. Our mothers, my wife. Shout out to everybody, man. We we appreciate your contributions, not only to our lives, but to the world. So shout out to all the women. Yeah. Time to make time to make some money. Yeah. So let's let's let Ian in. Set so the dunny in. Yeah. It's time to get to it's time to get to it, man. And shout out to everybody out there that you know showed us love. For both of our birthdays, for me and Troy's birthdays back to back. So um yeah. <laughs> yeah, shout out to everybody that showed up. That was uh pretty epic. Yeah. Pretty epic. Which one is it? Uh second. I mean either. It don't matter. Yeah, shout out to everybody to show some birthday love. It was a hell of a night. My, one of my favorite artists of all time was in the building. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, shout out to Siegel. It was his birthday yesterday. Happy birthday. And happy birthday to the, Pisces. Bro- the Broad Street bully himself. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah a, he's we, got a, a, we got a duet album coming up. <laughs> shout out to Beanie, man. That was dope. That was dope for me. I'm sure everybody in attendance got a, you know, a, uh, a thrill when that when that happened, man. So shout out to uh, Beanie Siegel, Desert Eagle. Yeah, 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 yeah. And anybody Beanie. that wanted to challenge me in Rockefeller karaoke, good luck. Beanie Mac. Good luck. For sure, for sure. We don't play about this Rockefeller thing. Here go the done. All right, let's get him in here. Let's get this show on the road. All right, so um, yeah, we're not gonna waste too much time because there's a lot to cover and um, we have a guest, so we just get right to it. Um, as we wait for Ian to come on, I guess you can you can start with the- uh, Yeah, yeah, let's do it, man. Shout out to all the earners, obviously the Red Panda family that's coming in here. Shout out to everybody that's that's on YouTube and all our earners in here. I wanna let y'all know about a great choice if you're looking to bank or invest. Our good folks at Ally, they're a leading digital financial service company with passionate customer service, innovative financial solutions, and our relentlessly focused on doing it right for both customers and communities. Get with allies so you can save, invest, and spend on the things that matter to, most to you. For everything we need, we're all better off with an ally. We got some news to announce too about with them. Shout yeah, out, for sure. Shout out to the good folks at Ally. For sure. So, uh, well, there you go. You wanna say the disclaimer? Yeah, let's get to it. Let's get to it. Ian, you good, man? Yeah, I'm good. How y'all doing? Yeah, you good, doing good, good. You know that. Yeah. Came on from two different uh, devices. <laughs> Your webs won't let me be great. Yeah. They don't want you to be great. So what you gotta do? You know that. Be great. All right, y'all. Ian, I'm gonna just do this disclaimer before you say anything. So let's just start with this, man. Doing your own research. I know you would agree. Our content is intended to be used and must be used for informational purposes only. It's very important to do your own analysis before making any investment based on your own personal circumstances. You should take independent financial advice from a professional in connection with 
or independently research and verify any information that you find on our show and wish to rely upon, whether for the purpose of making an investment decision or otherwise. This is a message brought to you by the good brothers at Earn Your Leisure and the good brother Ian Dunlap, the master investor himself, man. Do your own research and continue to do it. And after you do the research, share it with somebody. Yes. That's why you know that you've learned something. So um, before we start the show, let me just make some announcements. Earn Your Leisure. We got a big episode coming out tomorrow with my guy, Jeremy Anderson, who um, uh, he, he actually did a lot for us. He hosted Invest Fest. That was a legendary situation for Major. My, on his part. Um, so Jeremy is a world-renowned uh, motivational speaker. So it's a really dope episode about the motivational speaking business, how you can get into the motivational speaking business, how you can make a lot of money from being a motivational speaker. And you don't have to be like, you know, Tony Robbins and, you know, one of these guys to make a living doing motivational speaking. Like right? you can make a lot of money with, you know, 10,000 followers and 5,000 followers. You'd be, so we learned that from uh, Jeff and Lenny. Yeah. Shout out to our guys. They was getting paid. Trilla, not true. They was getting paid a boatload of money from speaking at colleges, but a couple thousand followers. So speaking at schools, speaking at institutions, corporate, it's a lot of opportunity. And as the world starts to open back up again, it's going to be even more opportunity for in-person, um, you know, speaking engagement. So that's a dope episode. Definitely check that out tomorrow, eight o'clock. And um, <clears throat> wanted to make an announcement. So we got a big, big, big situation that's coming up. So South by Southwest, yeah. one of these things that I always heard about, you know, for a long time, but I never actually went to it. But I always heard about South by Southwest from the music week to the tech week. So this year, EYL Invasion, we are partnering with our, our partners at United Masters and it's sponsored by the good folks at Ally. So March 17th. Yeah. One day, one day only. <laughs> one day, one day only. March 17th, Austin, Texas, South by Southwest. This is the lineup. We're going to have a Web 3.0 panel. Yeah. I'm talking about NFTs and uh, Metaverse and all that stuff with the legend himself, John Henry. Whew. And I got Buster. I boy got Buster. Loop. He Buster was the first person that we had on that spoke about NFTs. And that was over a year and a half ago. Yeah, April 21. Yep. yep. So that's going to be dope. And then, of course, we're going to have a fireside chat with the legend Bun B. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout yeah, out yeah, to yeah. Texas. Talk about true. Then they're going to be have a musical performance. Of course, we got DJ Michael Watts. If you're from Texas or you know anything about Screwed Up, click Michael Watts. That's legendary situation. Bun B will also be performing musically. And um, highlighting the musical performance is Toby Wigway. Yeah. Um, to the bro. Toby, the hottest, Legend. the hottest in the game right now, independent superstar. He will be highlighting the musical performance. I'll follow me. And then, of course, <laughs> of course, for the first time ever. Yeah. For the first time ever on, <sighs> on stage together, we will be having an investing panel fireside chat conversation with Ian Dunlap, the master investor and Wall Street Trapper together Ooh. in person for the first time ever. I don't think that's ever happened before. First time ever in person. Ever. ever. This is going to be fun. March 17th, I Austin, get... Texas. <laughs> Legendary five. Um, RSV space is limited. Space is limited. Now, we've, we've said this before and people like kind of took it lightly. Yeah. Please don't take that lightly. Well, you saw what happened in London. <laughs> so, all right. This is <laughs> this and is one we didn't get a chance to see. I'm sorry. Proof we'll of concept. Back. Oh, yeah. I got to say something about that, too. Don't but, ever play so everybody. All right. So, you know, everybody, everybody always talk about the culture. This is a free event. Everything that I said, this is a free event from the from the musical performance to the education all blended together. Um, but you must RSVP and you must get there early. Please. Three please. hours prior, please. please. <laughs> I told you before. Yeah. They, yeah. they Q score high, mine is high. People gonna come out. Same thing for South by. Please yeah. get there early. And it might not be a situation where we can walk the streets. It, the streets will be kind of flooded. So it's gonna be tough for us to get out there like we would normally do. So please yeah. get there early. Uh, I wanna see everybody. I wanna shake everybody's hands. I wanna take pictures with everyone. We greatly appreciate everybody that shows up for us like y'all do. So we want to make this worthwhile. So make sure y'all yeah. get there early. South by Southwest, March 17th. Click the link. Get there early. Be ready for a hell of a performance across the board. And the last thing I'll say before I pass the mic is that, um, once again, apologies to everybody in England that was not able to get into the venue. Um, but we said that we was going to do a, um, a webinar about real estate investing. So what, we, what we're going to do is real estate investing, investing, webinar on monday 
next Monday, 2.30, uh, well, 7.30, 7.30 London time, mm -hmm. 7.30 London time, um, PM. And that will be with Matt, Matt, MG, the mortgage guy. He's going to go over all of the stuff that he talked about as far as how to invest foreign nationals. Um, he has a mortgage broker that's out there that is going to be talking about, you know, mortgages specifically. And then we had somebody that taught a class for EYL University who used to work at uh, Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, one of those two. I'm not sure if you've met him, Ian, but um, he's a real good guy. And um, he's going to be talking about stocks but from a uk perspective mm -hmm. because their stock laws are a little different like etfs and it's, it's a little bit different than how we we do it here in america so we're going to cover the gambit from real estate to investing um and that's for everybody and that's just to make good on you know the situation that if you you know couldn't uh step foot inside yeah. the building so yeah. Emails will be going out for that. Yeah, that's for our people out in the UK who came to the event RSVP. Somebody's going to be like, how do I attend? Well, you have to be on that RSVP list. So those people who are on the RSVP list, we're going to send the emails out to you and make sure you attend that because it's going to be full of knowledge. It's going to be a lot of rants, lots of gems, and it's going to be catered to the, to the people of the UK. So yeah. that's dope. Yeah, UK, UK based on right. information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, that's it. Um, Ian, the, the floor is yours. Um, I appreciate you guys so much. To so the owner of Tape in London, sorry you have to kick me out of your club for talking to the people. <laughs> but I, I, you know, wanted to make sure we could talk to the people that we could that made it in. Um, if you guys want to join a sniper program for free, you go to joinredpanda.com and put in your name and email. There would be no upsells, no downsells, no cross sell free. You guys will get that at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Um, Talk to Shadi. I think it's time that for the last time we drop a deal. So Stock Club next week will be available uh, for those of you who cannot afford the big price. Um, you guys will be able to get it for $297 for the year. So when these 300 new features come out, um, you will not get those. But the picks, the prices of where to get in, and the weekly call, which I'll never miss again. I don't care if I'm a Mars, Venus, go to heaven. <laughs> Me and Dream Team will be there. And God, right? Um, but $297 for the year. No upsells, no downsells, anything. Um, Dream Team Trading Room enrollment begins on April 1st. And shout out to my guy that made 41 grand trade in the last two months and only took four trades and lost none. I'm proud of you, brother. Let's run this up. Um, and thank you, brothers. Let's have an amazing show. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, let's do it. Um, all right. So let's get into this topic. You posted on Instagram that a recession is coming. Hot take. Mm -hmm. um, can you please elaborate on that? Yes, this will go into the files of, oh, my God, I don't think Ian is right. And then when it happens, we can catalog it. So between having a world war, uh, three potentially right now, a flattening yield curve, a weak job market. And now people in any market don't like when things are not stable or safe. So please write that, write that down. The market has the highest probability of going up when there is safety in the market. And now because the entire world is now teaming up against Russia, and then China came in at the last minute with the union pay mm. to allow them to be back on a payment platform. This is getting really scary. This looks like a movie where I'm waiting for the rock to come in and save it and be like, hey, everything's going to be fine. He's going to choke out Putin. Game over, right? <laughs> we are entering scary times. So anytime, and I know some of you are going to be like, hey, we need two consecutive quarters of GDP lagging. True. But that is a uh, lagging indicator of when it happens. So a lot of times, if for those of you who remember 2007 and 2008, when gas prices shot up like crazy and the job market weakened, you can feel it before we got there that something was really wrong. And we're back in that space again. I told you guys last year, if NFTs are going up, options are going up, companies that are not that great are going up double, they're, they are allowing you to get money last year to prepare for the winter that may come for two or three years. And then we're going to have another one um, inside of 27. Please be very careful. I know this is something that we don't want to hear, but what to do? I always tell every creator, every business person, focus on growing your business and invest at the same time. Build your base. It's a great time to build a base and you'll be good. Will it be scary as hell? Yes, but it looks like a recession is coming if they do not get this Russia situation handled very quickly. Talk about um, the China situation, which you had, uh, you talked about it briefly, but can you elaborate on that? I mean, now we're entering a season where the wars that are fought are economic wars of terrorism. So now Visa, 
Microsoft, I mean, Visa, MasterCard, mm-hmm. Apple, cut off the payment flow for Russia, right? And then China comes in and says, hey, you can use union pay. So before, when China was being quiet on their perspective on what they should do if they're allied to Russia or not, you always need to follow the money trail. So if they are now an ally, shout out to ally, to mm-hmm. Russia, what does that mean? It goes back to my theory that I've been saying forever. If they team up, it could be disastrous. Now, I think the strategy that the rest of the world took was brilliant because the new wars are not going to be fought with, with bombs and missiles. They will be fought, my bad. They will be fought um, financially. And this is why crypto is incredibly important. I know you guys were saying before, hey, Vitalik is not going to chime in. You need to go look and see what cryptocurrencies are backing Russia silently. Yeah. Not going to say Ethereum is one of them, but you should go look. And Coinbase said they won't take Russia off of their platform as well. You have to be very mindful what people are hiding this money and what those allegiances and ties may be. I think that's the interesting. I mean, you touched on a bunch of things. And so like really quickly, so the the, the Visa and MasterCard ban, it was like, obviously, this is a, a obviously a payment processing company. And so that's American, right? But they said that the domestic transactions can still happen. So if they're inside of Russia, they can still use it. Obviously, internationally, you can't use it anymore. The interesting thing is like what you said with that China Unity Pay. It was like, wait, this is the country, obviously, that we've been speaking about that has been tied to them for so long, stepping up to the bat when they needed them. I think the crypto piece is very interesting, though, because if you look at it, people are saying, hey, Coinbase, hey, Binance, you should restrict the amount of crypto that's allowed in Russia. But that kind of defeats the purpose of cryptocurrency. And so it's like, a double, what are you supposed to do? You can't cut them off because it, it, obviously the blockchain technology doesn't use it. But the people want now to use Bitcoin as a thing like, hey, we're going to stop it. Last week, we talked about how people were funding and, and sending money to Ukraine through cryptocurrency. But the other end of that is that there might be people that could be sending money to Russia the same way. Right. So you can't really ban it. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting time, man. Like right now, watching all this. Is, is really, really, really intriguing. Uh, and we, we should be paying attention to these little things. I'm glad that he brought up that, that uh, China union pay situation because that was kind of like a one minute article. That's a very big piece of news. It's a very interesting time that we're in right now. And shout out to my bro, Dave Gross. I had like an hour and a half conversation with him yesterday. If anybody doesn't know who Dave Gross is, that he's an um, extremely successful businessman, used to work on Wall Street for 20 years. Um, but he, you might know him from being Nipsey Hussle's business partner. Um, he was the guy you see with Nipsey Hussle all the time, who was, um, you know, really educating Nip on a lot of things, especially on the real estate side. So I was speaking to him and um, he was saying, like, you know, there's a shortage of, of investments out there, like where people can really put their money. And he was like, you know, you don't know how many people hit me up and starting these um, these funds to buy artists music, mm-hmm. like artist catalogs, because there's not a lot of place to get good returns on your investment right now. So people was looking at all kinds of alternative ways to invest money. And like musical catalogs, this is where the NFT thing comes into play. Mm-hmm. Real estate is already, you know, way overvalued. Stock market, you know, is in trouble right now. Mm-hmm. Cryptocurrency has been falling. So it's a very interesting, it's an interesting space right now. And it's also, this is another conversation, but um, goes back to like uh, valuations on companies, people looking to buy companies and stuff like that. People are just looking to spend money on things that they can get a good return on their investment on because it's it's not easy to get a a good return on investment, especially large, large sums of money. So um, it's interesting times that we're in. And uh, this, this Russia Ukraine situation doesn't look like it's going to be over anytime soon, even though they put a lot of pressure on uh, Russia's economy on the oligarchs it's being felt. (laughs) Um, But you know, Putin is, um, he's still, you know, playing the game to win. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But if China gets more involved, then that's going to give them more time. Like if China just would be not involved at all, I think it would be over pretty quickly. Over fast. As long as China keeps giving them lifelines, yeah. um, they're always going to be in the game. Yeah. And one of the things we talked about, and speaking of where people can invest their money, and we spoke about it last week was commodities. And literally, like when 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 Jess was on, shout out to Jess when she was like, "Yo, yeah. oil's going to 120," and when I, she texted me last night, like it's at 140. I'm like, yeah, "Wow!" Like we, me. we said it, and then I asked her to repeat it just to make sure. And yeah, she did. But also, nickel. Did you see nickel today? Well, All time high for nickel yeah. commodity. I remember going to see uh, Robert Kiyosaki in like 2007. Uh, he was at, had a speech in a, a seminar in uh, New York City, and all the whole seminar was about nickel. 
that's all he was talking about. Like you should invest in nickel, invest in nickel, invest in nickel, because everybody was already investing in gold as a commodity. And he's like, yo, nickel's the next thing. Um, and so to see it hit an all time high today, I was just like, man, this is this is pretty this is pretty interesting. And it, the, we we spoke about it. Like literally, when we spoke about it Monday, I watched some of the news outlets Tuesday. Everybody's talking about commodities. Absolutely, and, and <laughs> copy Jess. I want to be very clear because no one was calling that. Shout out to Jess. She'd been such a yep. that, but that's crazy. Like. So when we're telling you guys these pieces of information, please use them to your advantage. And even with Nickel, going back to your point, when Kiyosaki was doing those tours, I mean, Money Master the Game, one of Kyle Bass's uh, favorite strategies, if he could, he would put every dollar that he could into Nickel. So you have to have the right kind of diversification. And true diversification isn't retail, oil, gold, crude, EV, tech. Diversification Truly, like when you talk to people inside of hedge funds or family offices, it's to make sure that no matter what happens with your portfolio, that you are positive. And Ray Dalio tapped on it a little bit with the all weather strategy. That's not the real strategy that they use at, um, at his firm. But you have to make sure, even if the world falls apart, that you're able to print and produce money. And going back to your part, Rashad, capital allocators have to put money to use regardless. So they can't just sit on 500 million, 3 billion, $14 billion. They have to put the money somewhere. You guys have to continue to look. And that's why I always tell you, look at every asset class top to bottom. There is a market somewhere that is going to boom at some some time if you, if you find it. Yeah. yeah. And we spoke about and another one. And this is literally after Jess said oil, when we started talking about gas, I literally said, look, look at the ETF XLE. And we spoke about the two yeah. top allocations inside of it. And since that, since Monday, that ETF has gone up by $7. And if you've studied the history of that ETF, for it to have a $7 move is pretty, it's really drastic. It doesn't move like that, right? Um, so this was just like another just play that, had you just applied that information? Yeah. Sure, it, know it, the rest. I mean, Jess definitely, she definitely dropped the, um, some good gems in that episode. You should watch that episode again. Um, the traders market and there's opportunities in every crisis and the oil situation, um, you know, yeah, it's unfortunate if you're trying to get gasoline right now. Um, but right. if you're trading, if you're trading oils and futures, and you know you made some money, um, I think it's one. How much? One thirty a barrel? Something like that. Uh, it got up to that. I think one, when when it closed, I, I saw that like at one eighteen. Yeah. yeah so um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting, but you know, people are definitely looking for alternative ways to invest their money. Um, so yeah. I think while the European markets were open, obviously. The, the oil that's coming from Russia, a lot of it goes through Europe. So when the European markets were open, we it got up to like 140 a barrel. And then by the time the New York Stock Exchange had opened it, I got down to like 120 and then I sold around 118. So, And the bear market and the stock market, I mean, depending on how you look at it, we're already in a bear market. I mean, I know the NASDAQ, I'm not sure the percentage, but if it's- 21%. Yeah, yeah so, that, so the, the NASDAQ is already in a bear market because 20% from a high is a bear market. Mm -hmm. So NASDAQ is already in a bear market. And um, I think the S&P is at, or the S&P might be 13% or the, the Dow. The They're Dow, both double digits. They're headed, they're headed in that direction. So um, when you talk about a recession, you know, it goes hand in hand with a bear market and the stock market. And, uh, you know, this has kind of been my fear for a long time. I've been talking about this for over two years that at some point in time, we're going to have to have a real bear market in the stock market, um, which is another reason why I wasn't really overly enthusiastic about over leveraging on option plays, which I've, I've been very vocal about as well. Um, because when a bear market comes and like the last bear market that we had during Corona was the shortest bear market in American history. It only lasted a couple of weeks and that's not normal. And that was only because, you know, they put so much money into the economy and um, it's only so much, it's only so long that you can put so much money into the economy. Then right. we're seeing the effects of that now with all time high inflation. Mm -hmm. um, so now when they, when they start tapering the money that they're printing, now you see the effects of that. And now that, you know, it's, it's got to stand on its own. And then you couple, you cr couple that with, uh, you know, a crazy war that just popped out. Now, you know, we're in a real, it could potentially be a real bear market. And, you know, there's opportunities in bear markets, but there's also, you know, opportunities to lose a lot of money in bear markets as well. So I started my career. A lot of people don't nev never actually lived through a bear market because they wasn't investing at that point in time. But when I was a financial advisor, I came in in 2007. So I came in at the worst bear market that we've had in over probably 80 years. And that's when I started my financial planning career. So I understand when people's 401ks went from a million dollars to 400,000. Like, you know, that's real. They were about to retire in a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, yeah. you know, a lot of times, like, you know, we just kind of just, we talk about these things, but you got to understand that this is real life. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, people's life savings is on the line. So you got to be extremely, you know, careful, cautious, and knowledgeable because, um, you know, the last bear market, people just forget people have short-term memories, but a lot of people committed suicide. That happens. So, you know, it's just, it's just important just to keep that in mind. Like, you know, bad things happen during recessions. So everybody like champion, I wouldn't necessarily go around like just, you know, parading that you're happy for a recession or you're happy for a bear market. Of course there's opportunities, but you got to keep in mind that, you know, bad things happen during these times. And a lot of people um, mentally break down, lose everything, lose mm -hmm. their lives. So just keep that in mind from a humanitarian standpoint. Yeah. Force yeah. rates go up, domestic violence, child abuse. Yeah. So please, like check on people as the economy gets worse, please. Please. Um, okay. So let's 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 go into another uh topic if we can. Um okay. So, go into the one you want to go into. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm gonna go into this. What did you see that made you say the storm was coming in October? A couple of things. So when I, uh, a good site that you guys can look at is macrotrends.net and Guru Focus. So I'm always looking to see what are the governments buying? What are the companies buying and hedge funds buying? I saw when we started to top out that a lot of investors with big capital stopped putting their money to work. So, and once we get past a certain point, I knew we were going to taper back, but once I didn't see certain people putting in a lot of money and notice when the market was raging, everyone was going on, coming on Market Mondays, CNBC, shout out to everybody there. And then I noticed maybe in October, November, everyone got really, really quiet. And I saw, I started making some calls and texts. I'm like, hey, what's going on? Like nothing, normal market. I'm like, nah, I, I feel that there's something up. And then when Bezos started to let off some of his positions and some top CEOs began to sell off, I'm like, that's usually a sign. I told you guys, whenever you start to see about 25 to 30 companies break those all-time highs and executives start to uh, take those golden parachutes. That's a sign that they know that something is wrong. They can't tell everyone at one time that, hey, things are going to fall apart. So once I saw those things in tandem with everything hitting an all-time high, and I've said it from the beginning of the show, once quantitative easing stopped, we're going to go back to a real market. And once they began to taper, we got into a real market. So we're just now seeing what the market actually should be if they were not printing all of that money. So number one, always look at the yield curve. Number two, always look and see what the cycle of quantitative easing or printing of money from the Fed is. And then third, go look to see what the top five hedge funds are doing. That'll give you all the clues that you need to know if you should be buying or selling. Yeah, I felt like we saw these things. We saw these signs and we, we alerted everybody to these signs. We did. And it was just kind of just like, ah, oh, yeah, it's just a sign. <laughs> it's just a sign we'll keep going um so yeah i mean I, I remember when we were talking like yo uh elon sold some tesla stock yeah Bezos sold off some tesla like yo, Tim, like everybody's taking stock or selling stock in the company it's like yeah these are signs one uh, thing that you can learn from nature i i gave the um the earthquake i gave the fire 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 forest um reference before but if you usually if it's 105 degrees if it's 105 degrees what what is a good chance of happening. Rain? Exactly. Rain. You got to cool it off. Got to cool it off. So whenever anything gets to a point where it's just too hot, you should expect rain. And, you know, you see stocks at all-time highs. You see everything flying at all-time highs. At some point, it's going to get too hot. And rain is, a, is, is necessary. It has to cool off the environment. It just can't be 105 degrees every single day. It's just not conducive. Plants can't grow in that type of environment. So you learn a lot from nature and then you can apply it to just, you know, common sense. So you kind of could see this coming if, if you had, you know, any indication of that, what comes up must come down and it's a natural cool off. So. Yeah. And the more volatility we have, I always told you guys, that's why you want steady, consistent gains opposed to like really explosive. And I know everyone wants to flip and get the bag real quick, but if you don't know when to take it out, the downside for those of you that made 40,000, some of you turned around and then lost 80. So that's why I'm always big on every trade, have to know your target long-term. A couple of you asked me, hey, should I have stop losses on my long-term? If you're in a position where you can withstand it, no. Because the longer you want to hold equity positions in a company uh, is much better. I don't recommend it unless, let's say you have less than $5,000 you invested into the market. If you have 5,000 or less, yes, I will put a stop loss. 
If you have more than that in for long-term investments, I wouldn't. But this is why you want steady, consistent gains opposed to rapid growth of 40%, 50%. And then we tumble down 25% because it shakes your confidence and destroys your, co your confidence and your account at the same time. Let's go to a few more questions before we bring our guests on. One, well, I know this is something that people want to know. Should should they be buying now or waiting for more blood in the water? So <laughs> you buy the dip and it keeps, nothing is worse than buying a dip. I learned that in crypto years ago. You buy the dip and then it keeps dipping. Then you yeah. buy the dip again and it keeps dipping. And and then you just- They got that meme going around. It's like you just got like the Tweety birds like yeah. flying around in the head. Like you don't know what happened. Yeah. So what, what should they do? Should they be buying now or should they be waiting? Um, if you're buying quality, you should continue to buy. If you're buying something that is not top five, and I, I mean it's from the bottom of my heart, if it's not top five, you have to wait. You have to wait. And traders know this. When we have extreme volatility in the market and a market is just pinbarring like crazy and just going up and down, yes, you can make a couple good trades, but usually it doesn't last. Same thing with long term. So if you're looking at a three-year horizon, four-year horizon, two will be great. If you're looking to make money over the next three months, I will wait and put money on the sideline, especially if it's your last. But if it's not Apple, Microsoft, Google, Visa, AMD, I'm on a crypto side, Bitcoin. If you're in Ripple, I will continue to hold. Um, Cardano, I wouldn't touch. I wouldn't touch the decentral land. I would, other than that, I wouldn't touch it. Now we're, we're in the finals. We got two minutes left. Mo Williams not getting the ball. Shout, <laughs> shout, out, shout out, Abdullah. Appreciate you. LeBron's the greatest. I'm gonna go to you, Mo. William, Mo, I love you. I want to smoke. Shout, shout out to Mo. Mo can't get the ball, <laughs> or Eric. I'll say Eric Snow. Eric Snow can't get the ball. It's clutch time. We gotta go to Brian. You have to go to the most quality that there is. And you see, even with Apple, right? Buffett changed that classic Coca-Cola position from 20 years ago, and now Apple is that safe haven. When you see older statesmen in investing begin to park money in a company like that. That is also a sign that think like you guys put in chat. What per, what percentage of Apple does Warren Buffett own, and how many shares? There's a reason he parked all that money there. He parked it there for protection. You want to put your money inside of a safe that will not burn down, that will not mold if, if it gets water on it. Like it's an ultimate hedge, right? So when you see hedge fund managers begin to put a bunch of money in one key position. It's a sign that things are going to slow down in the market and they have to still produce alpha. So if they have more diversification, it means that the market is broader, it's doing a lot better. If they hyper-focus, usually a sign that the market is going to tighten and things are going to fall apart. Ian, on the crypto side, you, you left out uh, Ethereum intentionally or you, are, you not, are you not big on, on, on Ethereum long-term? Listen, man, if, if, if Wakanda was real and uh, T'Challa needed me, well, I'll put every resource behind Red Panda and T'Challa. I'm not going to say it publicly, though. What's any different than Ethereum? I've been telling you guys from day one what my entire thesis on crypto was. And I, because, and I want you guys to understand this, right? Because I'm trying to make sure I keep my mind. Oh, can you, can you can you explain, can you explain that reference? If, you if you lost, you lost me. <laughs> if the founder of Ethereum is Russian, he can't publicly say in the United States, I am pro-Russia. But if his family's in Russia, who do you think his allegiance would be to? I've been telling you guys since the very beginning. They have tricked the United States American public into investing into assets that are not, this is financial treason. And here's the crazy part. People don't even care. Bro, I don't want to hear that. I don't care about no nationalism. I'm black. Bro, I don't care. They tear the country down. Bro, I feel you. I want y'all to get y'all coins. But if they get a, okay. And then when all these hacks happen and the information gets stolen, you don't think that they're not using that to their advantage? This is a deeper game that they're playing. And also with Russia, please don't be surprised if, and now we'll stay clear away from this topic because I can hear my dad in my head right now. <laughs> please do not be surprised if Vladimir Putin all of a sudden decides to just leave and disappear for a year and then pop up in China. Russia falls apart, but him and Xi Jinping plan to. I told you guys from the very beginning, the first way to infect and destroy a country from the inside is through the financial instruments. It's not about getting your boots and your war hat on and just shooting your rifle. It's a different game. It is cyber warfare and financial 
economic terrorism. And if they convince the American people to buy Bitcoin, which is a Chinese asset, quote unquote, Ethereum, which is a Russian one, and then Elon Musk, as great of a CEO as he is, is Dutch. It's the top three assets. What does that do to our ecosystem? Nike does not sell Iverson in their store for a reason. It's a bigger game. And I know it. no one will believe it. But when you guys write this documentary and do these movies, please quote us as having said this, that this is going to happen. And uh, shout out to those of you who sent me the Dan Pena video. Dan Pena was saying this a year ago, and I had never heard it, that he thought Putin was majority owner of Bitcoin and crypto. And then Russia owns a great majority of Ethereum. Well, mm. there's rumors that um, Vladimir Putin is the richest person in the world. Yes. That's true. Yes. That, that, what y'all say out there? Big Fendi. Big fact. That's real. <laughs> big, big Fendi. With the double big Fendi. Ass. That's a Fendi. Uh, yeah. Same well, thing. Just... If Apple to me is the mafia, kudos to everyone at Apple. I love you guys. I know you don't like when I say that. You guys are a kind cartel. Um, if you get 30% off of every business, that makes you the mob, essentially, that provides protection. What percentage of business in Russia does Vladimir Putin get? A lot. Next subject. Yeah. No, you know, I'm glad you said that. We had this interesting conversation uh, with Steve Harvey, but I had one today. Whereas like in certain parts of the world, your wealth is not discussed. Like that's really like kind of a United States thing where we create publications like the Forbes and what like where your wealth is broadcast. And there's plenty of people with that have large assets that won't discuss their wealth that have way more money than I guess what we assume to be the wealthiest people in the world. Um, and they do that very intentionally. Very intense because the, the the wealthier you get, the more you want to protect yourself from anyone trying to attack you. So that, it was just an interesting thing. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because we had this conversation offline about Putin and, you know, the amount of money that he's put inside of the wealthiest people's uh, accounts inside of Russia. Um, allegedly. 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 We did use the word alleged. Very, very important word. We it's did say allegedly. Purposes only. In text. Very important word. Yeah. Always alleged. Um, allegedly. So it's interesting, man. Um, my mentor used to tell me back in the day that um, publicity is for those who are rich that are aspiring to be wealthy. The purpose of being wealthy is to be hidden so you can then protect your family and your power. Um, the higher you get up that food chain, you'll see the real richest people on the, they're hiding in plain sight. They're hiding in place. I'll ask you guys a question. Who owns all the toll road? Name me the person that owns all the toll roads in the United States of America. Now talked about on Twitter. He's not going to do anything on spaces on Twitter. It's a different game. That's why I tell you, you're going to see in two years, especially when, when mark my words, and 50 may be one of them, stars pay my guy what he needs, right? In two years, you're going to see probably 30 or 40 entrepreneurs go on huge press campaigns about how they went bankrupt just so they can get out of public eye and sail off into the sunset with their riches. What do you think all these golden parachutes are about? Can you guys put in chat how many CEOs have exited with golden parachutes in the last six months? You always have to follow the money and that will tell you what you should invest in or not. That's why I say if Tim Cook stays at Apple, we're good. We're good. If he leaves, I'll be the first to tell you, yeah, it's over. <laughs> no, no more Apple in that two tech, two index formula. You got to get a replacement. As long as Sati is at Microsoft, we're good. The, the, the clues are there. Like if leadership is starting to leave, that's usually a trouble and sign but yeah the, the, the real richest people in the world i don't want to be revealed yeah what a t <sighs> trillions well on that note let's switch gears a little bit and bring in our esteemed guests um if we can very enlightening conversation so far <clears throat> You're tuned in to the conspiracy theory <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey hey this is hey this. queen how are you Oh, you, you, you're muted. I should know by now. Going oh. to be year three of the pandemic. Hey. Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. <laughs> it, it's going on. How, how are you? How are you? I'm doing well today. The world is kind of a crazy place at the moment, but uh, today I'm doing pretty well. The world is how definitely. Are you doing? We're great. <sighs> Hanging in there. Great. Thank you for being here. Surviving the yeah. times. Yeah. Um, Welcome to Market Mondays. Yes. So um, let me let me introduce our esteemed guest, uh, Rachel. Roba Shoti. Ooh, nailed it. Ooh, good job. <laughs> nailed it, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That boy professional. Mm-hmm. Avicina. Adesina, close. Adesina. Right Adesina. 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 Adesina Social Capital. Yes, and and so Rachel is the president and CEO, founder and CEO of Avicina Social Capital. So <clears throat> this is this is why this conversation is very important. So the firm is solely focused on socially responsible investing. Is that the correct term to use? There are lots of different names for values aligned investing and socially responsible investing is one that's fallen a little bit out of fashion. Now, mostly people refer to it as ESG or environmental social governance, but we go a step farther than that. We use the term social justice investing. We created it back in 2018. Social justice investing. Mm-hmm. Very, very important because um, it's ethical investing, ethical investing um, and We'll explain through her backstory why that's important. But uh, a lot of times people, you know, have dilemmas as far as like religious dilemmas or just their social belief. They don't want to invest in like prison companies. They don't want to invest in companies that contribute to, you know, war, cigarettes, things of that nature. So it's a whole industry of, um, you know, socially responsible, social justice Mm -hmm. type of investing formats. And then another part is that is that um, so she actually has an ETF. JSTC is the um, the ticker. Mm-hmm. So this is the first person that we've actually sp- spoken to that has um, an ETF. So that's exciting. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of questions yeah. about that as far as starting an ETF and you know that whole route. Um, and and um, yeah, it's uh, debuted in 2020, I believe. Yeah, December 8th, 2020. Yes. Um, our one year anniversary, the end of last year. Can, congrats, you know, congrats. that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, most of them don't make it past six months, so we're pretty happy. No, yeah, yeah, congratulations. Um, so yeah, this, this is this is a very important um conversation. Oh. So, first and foremost, thank you for joining us, appreciate it. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here, and I've been listening to the conversation, uh, and it's really insightful. Oh, appreciate, thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate <laughs> that. So we could do like a, a round table where everybody can ask a question. But the first question I want to ask is, I spoke to you offline, so I kind of know, you know, the backstory and why you're passionate. But can you explain, uh, you know, briefly, like your backstory and why um, socially responsible social justice investing uh, is something that is near and dear to your heart? Absolutely. Um, So I think when we spoke, I shared with you how I grew up, which is, um, it's a story that in finance is a really unusual story, but I have to say that for most Black folks in the United States, it's not. Um, I grew up very poor, single mom, all Black community that was segregated. It was a very rural community where I grew up. And um, like in most, in many Black communities, it was primarily women, the jobs went to men, um, but it was primarily women in the community because um, the men were either incarcerated or had been killed. I have uh, three different family members that have been killed by the police, um, which I know was news to finance and much of the white world, but wasn't news uh, if you have um, any love or community with black folks. Um, So I grew up in the situation where gender and racial justice were clearly important, like I was living the effects of not having them. Um, And, you know, it had this direct impact on the economics and how we were living. But then something kind of interesting happened in 2017. And, you know, I had kind of pulled in racial, gender, economic justice into the work that I was doing in finance. Um, But something interesting in 2017, we'd had the historic climate change had brought all of this snow right after a drought and the Oroville Dam. So there was a big water development project that black people had been brought up to um, put in place and a lot of black folks died um, make creating that dam. It was about to burst, right? Because of all of this climate change. And I was like, it is so obvious to me that the very community that was brought up here to build the dam is going to be the one most impacted by climate change. And wouldn't you know it, when they were showing the evacuation routes on international news, it was the south side of Oroville, which is where my folks were from. And it just really cemented my understanding that these issues of racial, gender, economic, and climate justice are very intertwined. And I know this is something that a lot of us know in our gut, but um, bringing it actually to the financial markets is is my reason for being, not just because these are my values, 
and finding companies that like that align with these issues are like my values. It actually makes really good financial sense as well. So because we're a big part of the population, all those folks yeah. that get marginalized. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the things you said was ESG, and I, I'm sure that there's a, a large part of the audience who have never heard the acronym or what it what it exactly is. Can you talk about what ESG is, environmental social governance is, and how do we find companies that that fit that criteria? Absolutely. So, generally speaking, there's a lot of companies that and asset managers that now say that they're doing ESG investing, and basically what it means is that they take things into consideration other than the direct financial reporting that companies put out and their share price. Like, so what they're saying is that these public companies, we're looking at their environmental impact, their social impact, their governance impact. But what's really interesting is that they're simply taking those things into consideration. It doesn't mean that they're actually absolutely screening in or at, out like the good or bad actors, um, which is why we went a step farther. You know, when I created social justice investing and, um, and the strategy that became Addisina back in 2018, it was because we were seeing like oil companies show up in ESG portfolios and we were seeing, um, you know, I mean, we were seeing like uh, weapons manufacturers show up in ESG portfolios. And we were like, wait a minute, something's not right here. And what we realized is that finance is just talking to itself. Finance is like talking to other financial analysts about how to define these things and that we needed some more accountability with the communities that we wanted to impact. So that's the direction that we headed. Um, but it's definitely, we are on the um, outside edge of ESG. Many people think of us as like the future of ESG investing. Do you think since you've taken this uh, moral stance in a somewhat corrupt system that you haven't gotten the backing or support that you would have wanted for your ETF? Well, I can tell you, um, so we are at just under $100 million in assets, which sounds like a lot of money, but for any fund, that's actually, um, let's just say that we still have to do a lot of other work and get revenue from other sources kind of coming in. I didn't start an ETF to have $100 million, um, and it actually started an ETF. I built it as a billion-dollar ETF from Jump, and where it is right now is that a lot of people said that it was what they wanted, it's what they were interested in. And that's why, you know, we're past the one year mark, we're, you know, um, coming up on 100 million. But really being new is one of the worst things that you can be in finance. Everybody wants a track record, wants yes. to see that it's tried and true. And so, yeah, it's been tough. We've been, um, I, I, I joke about it and I say that uh, it feels like I'm having to pave the ground in order to walk it. Like, you know, you go to try to get into these big institutional portfolios and they're like, great, where's your three-year track record? Yet everyone's saying they want more diversity and asset management. So we've public, been yeah, yeah, starting all kinds of campaigns to kind of like change the way managers are evaluated and get more folks in. So let me ask you that. And it's actually, uh, actually uh, 19 Keys, I don't watch the show, but 19 Keys told me at Billions, the last episode or the last episode that he watched, um, I think in this season, he's moving into like being uh, ESG for his fund, mm. socially responsible investing for his fund. So it's actually interesting because it's right along the lines of this conversation. So, um, OK, let me ask you this. What is the process to start an ETF? This is something that I I'm interested in, in knowing. So first, we had an investment strategy in-house. We had um, wealth management clients. So um, I was very lucky and started, uh, I was very lucky in my community and um, was born with above average intelligence. I graduated from high school when I was 15. I started a financial firm when I was 25. I have to say that because when I tell people I have over 20 years of experience in the industry, they don't believe me. Um, so uh, in our wealth management firm, we put a strategy in place. Um, that was like, hey, you should be buying these stocks, not these, based on this set of values and also what you believe the financial returns are going to be for the companies that are listening, right, to these movements. Um, and we had run that strategy for over a year. So you have to already have a strategy and some way to implement it. And then what we realized is that a lot of folks said, you know what, I really love your strategy, but I don't want to leave my financial advisor. Can you make a fund? And a lot of financial advisors were like, this is a really great idea. If you made a fund, you know, we'd want to invest. And so um, one of the things that you have to do to create an ETF is build a trust. So it's this whole large instrument that gets um, has oversight with the regulators uh, that can cost a lot of money, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. We didn't have that. And so what a lot of folks do when they start an ETF now is partner up with an ETF trust. So uh, Title ETF Trust is a company that we partnered up with. So they have a board, they oversee and make sure that, you know, 
we're dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's and, and uh, managing the strategy the way that we say we will. Um, but the process of actually creating the ETF is a lot of regulatory filings. And, um, but it does end up with you trading your fund over the stock exchange. It trades like a stock, which is really important because uh, you know, the, a lot of the mutual funds out there have pay to play at the different um, brokerage companies where you would buy them. You know, you have to like pay $50,000, $100,000 to get your mutual fund even sold on yeah. certain brokerage houses. So we were like, we want to trade just like a stock. So we went the route of the ETF, rang the bell on Wall Street virtually because it was a pandemic. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the short story of how to create an ETF. Which part interests you most? Um, so as far as uh, how did you get listed? Like every once you do all the paperwork, how much money do you need to have in it? And how do you get listed? You're on the New York Stock Exchange. So how did you get listed on it? Does every ETF go to the New York Stock Exchange or not? Like what's the process for that? No, that's a really good question. Actually, you choose. So you can be on the NASDAQ, you can be on um, the NYSE. Lots of times choosing which exchange you're on is just kind of like which exchange has the reputation for your particular type of product. We're a long only product, public market stocks. Um, you know, we aren't doing short sales or anything like that. And so um, the NYSE ARCA made the most sense. But you do, you do choose, it's a pretty straightforward application process. That's not the hard part. The hard part is getting a market maker. So um, actually getting, um, and we were really lucky um, that, you know, we found a brother that was um, actually in the space, because let me tell you, when I say we're really lucky, asset management is almost 99%. Um, the firms are owned by white men. So it's a big deal to have a black woman owned firm and to actually have a market maker where the person that was representing us is a black man. Um, so you actually finding a market maker, that's somebody that's willing to say like, hey, when people want to buy your ETF, I'll go, I'll go buy $1.5 million and resell it, right? Like resell to people that want to buy your ETF because you only have certain authorized participants that can buy ETFs. They're these huge, usually huge banks. And you have to have a market maker that's willing to like go make a market for your ETF. So that's actually the harder part and more of the relationship part. That's a, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, so <laughs> that is a lot. Yeah, yeah. So the, I, I know that you, you, obviously racial justice is key, gender justice, economic justice, and uh, climate inequities is, is kind of what the, the the ETF is based off. But what is the criteria? Because I went through the list and I'm looking at this. Is this something that you and your team came up with, or did you meet with organizations and said, "All right, what are the things that you want to fight for?" Like yeah. I'm assuming, like color of change and. Black yep. Lives Matter. Are, are you meeting with these people to come up with criteria to say this Absolutely. is how? Okay. Yeah. So that was the big problem. Like, you know, how do you end up with these like really bad public actors inside of ESG portfolios? And it's like there's no accountability mechanism. So we set ourselves up to be accountable to the movement for these particular issues. So, like, the movement for Black Lives is one of our social justice partners. We follow the lead of Color for Change. And these are organizations that we've met with and meet with regularly to say like, okay, there's suddenly lots of interest in racial justice investing. You know, it looks like the industry's turning, this happened in 2020, the industry's turning its attention toward uh, people on corporate boards. Is that where you want us to focus? No, the answer came back. You need to keep, you know, keep on working on decarceration and ending profiting in private prisons. So not only do we um, not include those types of companies in our portfolio. We also research the underpinnings of what allows those companies to exist. Like what are the financial instruments? And we organize other investors um, with us to divest and to actually start bringing down some of those asset prices long-term. So yeah, but then, you know, it's, it's focusing on what people say actually matters versus the data that may be available and seems related. That's generally how finance and ESG works right now, which is people really surprised when I say that, but truly it's like, oh, what, what do we have data for? I guess we can count the number of people we think on the board who might be people of color. I'm like, that's not a way to address racial justice. You have to end the like profiting from mass incarceration, which is that whole system that put the knee on George Floyd's neck. Like that's what you have to do. And, you know, and setting up accountability to the right communities ensures that you do that. So they yeah. oversee the, the, we have a set of, uh, we have a stewardship circle, very unusual, that actually oversees what our portfolio management team is doing. And all those folks are activists in these different movements. What, what's the time span when, when, you're, when you're doing that type of data research on a company? Like how long, would that, how long does that process take? Because I, I mean, I would figure 
that most people is the information public knowledge or are people making it difficult for you to find this type of information? Well, you know, our favorite type of data, there's a big market in data out there right now. Um, there are companies in the investment world where they sell data, and, but the data is, you know, sometimes just a few analysts doing Google searches. Um, one of the things that we do is partner with the social justice movements to have them produce data on the metrics that they told us to pay attention to. So we actually, um, we take whole data sets by partnering like with certain communities. So like the Quakers, for example, are helping us research around um, uh, surveillance, which we know how surveillance impacts folks um, and facial recognition technology, um, how both of those impact our community. Um, and you know, the Quakers say they're still abolitionists. Uh, it's just turned to mass incarceration and over-policing. So like we actually work directly with them and they're working also with the racial justice organizations to, to research the company. So what we do is really like compile and layer multiple data sources on top of each other. Um, we do the kind of manual digging through each individual company once we put them through a giant filter that mm -hmm. layers all 40 metrics, all or all 40 criteria, all 61 different ways of measuring it. You start with like 9,000 companies, you get, you come down to less than 2,000. And then you need to actually like go through manually and research those. And that's what we do. So we start with the big data, but we try to get that big data from public sources and from uh, social justice organizations as much as possible. Quick question for you. Uh, over the last year, we've seen the rise and planned fall of Kathy Woods. Um, we all know that women are better retail investors. What advice would you give to women that want to break into the industry, but may get disheartened by the challenges and prejudice that they may see you go through or what Kathy's gone through over the last year? That's a tough one. I mean, I started my own firm. I wasn't like a 25 year old that was like, I just want to do it, you know, my own way. I actually was facing, you know, all the racism, all the sexism. Um, and I had to create a firm and go it on my own because there wasn't a place for me. I think the most important thing that I would say is like, we got you. We're creating a place for you. Um, over well over 50% of um, everybody that works at our firms are women or um, gender uh, non-conforming. Well over 50% are black. Both of our uh, or our uh, black indigenous or people of color, and um, both of our portfolio management teams are black led. I mean, go. There are places that are being created for you. We're paving the way now. Um, find ways to come work with us. So there's us, and if we're not hiring for what you're looking for, we can help you find a place. Amazing, thank you. But there wasn't, 20 years ago, there wasn't. Yeah, there wasn't. No. So you have $100 million of assets under management, um, and you're trying to scale to a billion. So how did you get the 100 million? With how, All right, so you, you you go through the process of set, setting up the ETF, yep. and, and now you actually have to get people to invest in the ETF. Yeah. So how do you go about marketing and getting money to come into the ETF? Well, one of the most important things that we can do is make our product available to financial advisors because they are the gatekeepers for large amounts of assets. And when a financial advisor gets it, understands what we're doing and that the financials work out, that unlocks lots and lots of assets. So, um, that's one route. However, lots of financial advisors just go automatically for like the lowest cost fund because we're basically index, we are index based. There's an index that we created that we track. You know, we aren't trying to um, like shoot the moon, it's index based, thank you. But when people look at the expense ratio, they're like 89 basis points, like that's high. And I say to them, well, the reason you're getting so much greenwashing and impact washing is because you're telling people that they have to do all of this additional research with no additional assets that you're giving them. So we pay our folks a living wage and we do the additional work and the proof is in the pudding. I mean, ultimately it really helped getting featured by the New York Times in 2020. Um, and we have a pretty big platform. We make sure we leverage the media to work on some of our issues. So like we put up, um, we put up a list of all the, uh, on our website at adesina.com, you can get a full list of all the companies that are participating in the mass incarceration system. 
And um, we engage the media in calling up some of these asset managers and saying like, oh, you made this pledge around racial justice, but you're still holding prison bonds. We see you got rid of the stock. What about the bonds? And we had an unprecedented drop in the holdings in prison bonds at the end of last year. So, I mean, leveraging the media has been really important. And thankfully, we're, we're saying they're kind of giving us the mic for the first time. We're finally saying everything that the world's paying attention to. You know, like all these issues of racial, gender, economic, and climate justice are all coming up because, you know, as Ian said, it's extractive capitalism is not sustainable long term. Like extracting from people on the planet is not sustainable long term. And most people are looking out for their future. So, you know, it, it when that starts to become apparent, then everybody kind of like wants to talk about what it is that we're up to. And the media helps out significantly. That's big. Now, you, you spoke about bonds. Uh, I, I, when I was on the site, I, I found something very interesting. Um, the fiscal justice municipal strategy, where you're actually buying bonds. Can you, can you talk about what that is and, and kind of explain a little bit to, to the audience? Yeah, I'm going to do my best to talk about it without crying. Um, their, uh, black cities pay a premium inside of the municipal bond market. That's a fancy way of saying there's evidence of racial discrimination in the muni bond market. So same bond, black community versus a white community, the black community is gonna have to pay a higher interest rate, um, which makes it harder for them to raise capital for their communities across the country. Um, so we created a strategy that its um, primary purpose is flowing more capital to black communities. We already have 60 million committed in that fund. Um, but we're doing something else, like with 25% of the fund, we buy a special set of um, Black municipal bonds, and these are places where we have deep relationships with the community members, and they want something from their, um, they want something from their city council, they want something from their city treasurer, and aren't being listened to. So we have 25% of the portfolio where we go in as the bondholder. And we say, we call up the city treasurer, we call up the mayor's office and we say, hey, guess what? Your black residents have something to tell you. Um, it's kind of scary in some of the places in the South, you can have a whole black city and you know, not a majority black city council. But once you start speaking the language of finance, people pick up the phone. Cause you're like, oh, we're one of your bond holders. You're thinking about bringing another bond issue. You might want to talk to us about the issues we care about. And guess what the issues we care about are what the community cares about. So it's really, I mean, what I, I heard somebody uh, I heard somebody refer to it recently like we're I mean it, it's a particular way of ending the racial wealth gap by actually just like directly investing in those communities so yeah, I can't so remember the term that's what I mean recently. majority black communities we're buying the municipal yeah. bonds and to with the the foresight to say look we're going to use these bonds to improve our cities and when I look when I look at our clients' accounts and I see, and this, so here's the downside to this one. I want to create a fund out of this one so badly because I know um, our folks would buy it. Um, and it's so expensive to do. Um, and I and like I said, I created a JSTC to be a billion dollar fund. So I have to be a little cautious with how quickly I stand up funds. But this one, when I look at the list of holdings and I see Tulsa and I see Harrisburg and Vicksburg and I see Detroit and I really know that like we're actually flowing capital to good projects, to the right projects in Flint. Um, yeah, like I, I basically cry every time I look at our holdings. So that's the one, that's, that's my um, heart project. Can everyone put uh, amazing in chat if you think she's absolutely amazing? I want to know. What's the number one thing we can do to help you to become like a top 10 ETF? Because last year, everyone went ARC crazy, right? Everyone went ARC crazy. Buy JSTC. It's really simple. It's really straightforward. We've made it super simple for you. Um, there's a lot of information on the website about how to do that at adesinaetf.com. Um, and at adesina.com, you can just, you can see who our staff are, what the issues that we're working on are. You can see, you know, what the social justice organizations are that we're partnering with, but, um, buying JSTC is what you want to do. If you're not sure about it yet, you can always like subscribe to our newsletter. We're not spammers. We send information about social justice investing out about once a month. If you text, um, justice to 55444, four, four, four. it'll sign you up for that. So if you aren't ready to buy JSTC today. You're not gonna do one follow up? Yeah. Uh, I, know, I know you're limited on what you can say from a marketing perspective, but 
for those who may not be familiar with you yet or the ETF, uh, what competitive advantage would you give them in terms of return versus what they would get elsewhere? So one of the most important things um, about social justice investing is that it operates on this assumption that uh, that the social justice movements are giving us early indicators of risk. And I heard you talking about some early indicators of risk, but let me just like float some numbers by you just real quick. You know me, I'm all about the private prisons. Um, Core Civic is one of the private prisons. Their stock price was up 74% in, in 2012 in a year when the S&P was up 16%. This was before Black Lives Matter, any of the protests. 2014 comes along, Black Lives Matter. 2020 comes along, biggest racial justice protest ever. What do you imagine happened in 2020 to Core Civic's stock price? Well, that year they're down 62% in a year when the S&P 500 was up 16. So when I say that like social justice movements are giving us early indicators of risk, I'm talking like it's 1860, the civil war hasn't started yet. Do you really wanna be invested in plantations and slave ships? It's basically the way I feel about mass incarceration. So I think that there's a huge value proposition here. And it's not just, uh, you know, I hammer on this issue of mass incarceration because it's so um, important and also very personal for me. But we look at across the board when it comes to issues of gender justice and economic justice, as well as climate justice. We're on the leading edge of making sure we're the first to incorporate those into portfolios. Um, we actually did an episode about um, this uh, the week after George Floyd uh, was killed. And we talked about police brutality bonds mm -hmm. and debt. We talked about socially responsible investing. Um, we had a whole we had a whole segment about this, and uh, we we spoke about that. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we talked about what's the name of the private Fort prison? Civic. Mm -hmm. Fort Civic. We talked, we talked. We talked about them. Um, so yeah, this is definitely good information for sure, and it's something that people should definitely be aware of. Um, now, in your ETF, some of the companies that you have is Mastercard, Nvidia, Amex, Adobe. Um, what made you pick those companies and do you change allocations? Like, you know, obviously ETFs have flexibility where if one, if one company is not performing at a high level, then you can lower your percentage or kick a company out. I know your ETF is new. So have you, have you changed allocations yet since you oh, started? Yeah. We've shifted allocations. So we're active on issues of social justice and that's one of our primary risk management in addition to deep diversification that's one of our primary risk management tools but we're really i mean like we built an index on purpose like we're really trying to say this is a replacement for investors with social justice values so it actually has to be something that can be a core part of your portfolio so what that means is like we are not cowboy asset managers as they like to call them you know like just looking for what's good in the short term we're actually looking in the long term for like, who's going to pass all 40 of our screens, all 61 of our metrics for social justice. That's a hard thing to do. And we're letting the data drive the portfolio. And when companies don't meet those thresholds, we kick them out. And we have um, already on several occasions. So you got, you got 737 holdings. That's what I'm looking at. Is that correct? Yep. And so correct. I'm looking at the asset allocation percentages. It looks like it's pretty equal, equal weighted. Is that something very intentionally that you're doing? Or do you plan to stay that way long term? Just keep them equal weighted? We're talking about equal weighting each of the constituents, each company? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. If you're going to build a billion dollar fund and you want it to be a core portfolio, then it's actually important that it's very well diversified, which means not making crazy bets like that. We actually run an... Um, so we start with 9,000, you run it through all those data sets and get it down to under 2,000. We then run an optimization algorithm, which is, um, which is something that allows us to select by algorithm the best actors um, to really get it down to a core portfolio that is appropriately represented across countries, across sectors, across market capitalizations. Um, so taking short-term big bets, we're kind of the opposite of Kathy Wood and Ark taking short term big bets is what we're about. Um, we're all about the long term investor. So, does yeah. investing this way in a recession or economic downturn give you an advantage, or do you have a lot more drawdown during these periods? We've had a little bit of drawdown, but certainly not as much as other portfolios. It seems to be that, like, whenever there's turmoil in the world, 
there's always something relevant to our portfolio that's happening. People mm. are looking for places to put their money that will both get them the long-term returns they're looking for and also address the issues in the world that they care about. I think we've all learned that where we invest actually matters and you know we don't want to be funding the things we actually want to get rid of. So um, I was talking to a reporter from the New York Times yesterday who was asking about like what the drawdown has been. It hasn't been very much. We actually usually get a boost whenever these issues come up. So like even um, with us, we had one Russian holding and we removed it from the portfolio prior to the invasion because we did some updated research and found that they violated our surveillance screen um, and one of the data providers hadn't caught that. So we're just really able to stay on top of current issues in a very dynamic way and with information that really right now nobody else in the financial industry is paying attention to. Yeah, but, and, 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 and I will say that, um, you know, and your, your, your ETF is still new, but um, considering all things, it actually has a, a, a good performance. It may not necessarily look, first of all, it hasn't lost money. That's always a positive. Most important. Well, if you're comparing uh, uh, it to the S&P 500, that's hard because the S&P 500 is all US and it's a global all cap. But if you compare it to other global all cap indexes, it, the performance is beautiful. Yeah, well, like it started at $15 Mm-hmm. in 2020 and then it peaked at $18 yep. in uh November last November and you know obviously the stock market is down right now so it's at right. 15 1561 right now but it was on a nice run it was on a oh, yeah. on, it was on a nice run um leading up into you know when when the whole stock market as a whole um went down so um yeah definitely Absolutely. you know are, what would what would you be if you were pitching this to because this is you know this this is this the big show I'm gonna be honest I'm, <laughs> yeah. just gonna, I'm, I'm be honest with you I'm be I'm be completely like New, New York Times yeah. like New York Times is a big publication but this yeah. is a big this is a really big deal so the difference between the New York Times and your audience is that I believe your audience actually takes action exactly so. that's <laughs> the difference so this exactly. is the difference great job exactly so if you if you were pitching this if you just want to enlighten people like what would be your optimistic uh, pitch on why somebody should invest from an economic standpoint, looking to make money. So in the long term, what you actually want is stable, sustainable returns. And you don't get those by extracting from people on the planet. You get those by investing in companies that already have started thinking about this and are ahead of the curve. And the only way that you're really going to get that is by working with asset managers who come from the communities for which like you're actually seeking justice. So the fact that we are a different set of people in an asset management industry that's almost entirely white and male, and that we're looking at a different set of data, there's a competitive advantage there, but that competitive advantage isn't short-term. It's actually a long-term advantage because we're looking at true sustainability, true sustainability for the life of a portfolio. And I think that's ultimately, I mean, I know it's fun to play in short-term and at the edges, but ultimately that's what we all want is financial freedom. And so it's financial freedom that you don't have to sell your soul to get. Like, um, that. I like that. Yeah. Well, well, how do we also rally to get financial advisors, asset managers, family offices, fund of funds to support when, let's say the cards may be stacked in our favor and they may not uh-huh. be in favor of these social justice issues. So the number one thing they always tell us is that it's all about their clients, the client demand. And mm-hmm. so the clients have to tell their asset allocator that I want this particular fund or in another way to get at it is just to say, listen, I want my asset management, like I want the asset management to, re- to reflect the general demographics. And if you just start there, you'll automatically get a huge increase because there aren't very many of us in the marketplace. So, you know, you aren't trying to do anything special, just, you know, make sure that you have as many black portfolio managers, right, as there are generally in the population. The, um, the thing that we ask, if people want like a, the thing that really gets in the way is something called due diligence, which is when these asset allocators go through and say, we're gonna look at your three-year track record and how much you have under management and all these other factors. And what it does is it just, it selects for those who already manage money And those people all happen to be white and male. Um, And what we've created is something called the due diligence 2.0 commitment. If you go to due diligence commitment.com and I can even put it in here in the chat. Um, Oh, it's a long one. Yeah. Right. Due diligence commitment. Um, 
Com, you can see this is, it's actually a commitment to um, reform the way that due diligence is done such that BIPOCs, Black, Indigenous, and people of color managers aren't systematically left out. Because basically we fall out of these due diligence processes on a regular basis. Let me see if I yeah, and, and for those of you looking to break into the industry, even on the PR side, if you don't have a certain amount of assets in the management, certain connections, it's going to be hard for you to break through. Rashad, you were just talking about that last week, how a lot of financial advisors that were Black couldn't get a certain amount of money under management and it made their career path and journey a hell of a lot harder. So is there anything with both of you having experience could tell our audience to do to begin building a career in unison in the space so we can begin to have an impact and influence on the assets that or the ETFs that are picked up uh, with asset managers? Yeah, get yourself some support because I got to tell you, this is, listen, Wall Street was built by slaves. The first bond that was ever created um, was a mortgage-backed bond, but it wasn't a mortgage on a house. It was on a mortgage on a slave's body. Yep. The financial system was built on our bodies and built on extracting wealth from us. And so you need to get some support when you come into the financial services industry. Don't try to go it alone and fit in. It's not going to work. Join associations like Quad A, which is the African-American Association. Oh, I'm going to get that one wrong. Quad A is, uh, they're going to be mad at me. Um, but it's I can edit this out. What's that? You got it. Okay. Um, it, so join that association, become part of any of the investor, um, the Racial Justice Investing Coalition. You can find them online. We, you know, one of our folks started that. Um, get yourself some community because you are going into the belly of the beast. And I have to just tell you that like all of the, all of the isms that have made the world what we're dealing with today, like all back right up into finance and it's raw there. It's like, I don't, um, my family's from the South and there's a reason I don't go there that often. Um, and one of the reasons is because like sometimes the racism can be so raw. I gotta tell you, in financial services as a profession, it's very, very similar. Let me ask you so, this before, before we go. I love the South, to be clear. I do go to the South, but like, it's always, I what went to- What part of the South is your family from? Pardon me? What part of the South is your family from? Texas. Mm. Fast drop. Yeah, we might know yeah, some people we, out yeah, there. Yeah, we going out there, yeah. Austin. Yeah. Wait, real, real, real quick, and I know Shadi got one more too. Um, obviously, on a day to day basis, this is this is a lot. If somebody was interested in being part of your team, well, first of all, how big is the team that you have now working with you? And if somebody was interested in being a part of it, what would they have to do? Because I know there's a lot of people here saying like, "This is amazing. She's incredible. How can I be a part of this mission? I support it. I want to be part of the vision." Is there is there a way? This is so exciting that you're asking us because we are hiring right now. We seem to not be able to stop hiring. Um, so if you go to our website, um, I don't know that I've made that link as easy as I wanted to. Um, here you go. Was it? I was seeing Man, it. Put it in chat. Yep, yeah, I will. Can you put it, put it um, on YouTube? Somebody put it on YouTube. Is the, is your, is your, the website? Yeah, it's the adesina.com. It's our page where we have open Rachel, positions. Rachel. Oh, but yeah, here's the thing, like also find me, I tend to be, um, I'm taking your advice. I'm going to get on, I'm going to get more fully on Instagram. Um, but I tend to be on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, my handle on Twitter is at our Robichotti, which nobody can spell. Um, and uh, I'm pretty easy to find by that last name on LinkedIn, but do like, please reach out because even if you're not a fit for a position at our firm, it's a relatively small community, but we've really built up a community of good places for you. You don't have to start out, you know, at some shop that's making you cold call people all the time. There's plenty of good work in the industry and everyone, thank goodness, is now saying they want diversity in their asset management firm. So there are lots of opportunities. I would say, don't get discouraged. We're creating places for you. Yeah, I just I just pinned it on YouTube also. So the last question before I want to go, I want to go to some question and answers because we haven't done this in a few weeks. If you if you if you want to stay around, if you um, definitely oh, yeah. feel free. All right. But so the last question I have for you is uh, when we were talking on the phone and you were saying that I forgot exactly how you stated it, but you was like ninety nine or something point crazy percent. is like all like white male. And it was like it's not even enough to really just put like black people. You got to classify Black people, women, yes. women, men, like Hispanics all together just to get enough of a percentage. Can you explain that? 
Absolutely. So you're talking about, I was quoting this study. It's the diverse asset manager study from the Knight Foundation. They hired a Harvard professor and researcher to do work on like, you know, well, who owns the asset management firms, you know, this foundation and the um, firms owned by both women and minorities combined manage 1.3% of assets out of $69 trillion dollars a good chunk of which like we are, our ancestors are directly responsible for creating some of that wealth that's been passed down. 1.3%. Um, and when, um, when asked, when the professor was asked why they put together women and minorities, he said, I couldn't get the slice to show up on the graph if it went below 1%. And so um, by the way, I had to make the, the ownership be 25% or more. If you actually, like you had to lump women and people of color and say that the man, the, um, and that the ownership was only 25% or more. If what you want is just to look at women and people of color that are majority owned, it's less than 1%, it's 0.9. And you still have to lump them together to get 0.9%. So that's so like, the reason the world is the way it is, you know? That's extremely important and extremely disturbing for people to fully understand. So out of $69 trillion of assets under management, 1.3% uh, are those firms are run by women and people of color, which people of right. color is just everything. Right. It's everyone. It's everyone. It's everyone. And the reason why that is because they couldn't even do it just on individual basis because mm -hmm. the percentage would be so low. So right. they have to they have to put women and people of color together to equal one point three percent out of and, sixty nine trillion. And this is why, like, we, that's we not had, even majority. Yeah. We, had a, we had a gentleman from CNBC that came on a few weeks ago and he's talking about the wealth gap. And, you know, a lot, like I said, people was just like, they don't believe in it. And it's like, well, you got to really start don't to look understand. At the industries, and and yeah. then look, you got to start looking like there's levels to this. There's really levels to this. And it's like, you you look at wealth, like real wealth and who controls those real wealth. Like, so obviously one part of the story is that 99% of the asset managers in the world are, are white. But the other part is that majority of their clients are white also. Mm -hmm. So, you're talking about $69 trillion of assets being managed. What do you think the percentage of that that belongs to white people is as opposed to what belongs to black people? So I, you can, talk I can tell you right now, it's less than, it, or it's, um, it is greater than the asset managers. Uh, people, the public has come along so much faster than the asset management industry. I'm telling you, it's the great holdout. It's like, oh no, that's nice. You can get civil rights. You can get like laws. You can get, representation on tv oh wait but you wanted us to give you the assets oh can't touch the money like i can't, touch can't even i can't, can't even tell you me. the number of times i've had people be like well can i hire you to educate us and i was like no you can hire me to manage the money um but like you know very very large institutions will be like well we just you know we want to pay you just a certain amount just to educate us and our asset managers and i'm like like the money is not transferring fast enough in order for us to make real change because, you know, when we get in there, we tear it up. So that, let me do one final question, please. Big fact. So, so we know the challenges. What are the top three skill sets that you would want in someone that you would hire? And also, we're going to be very honest. We have to get high returns to get yeah, yeah. equal fo footing. What kind of returns will uh, African-American male or woman have to get to stand out in the industry, knowing that there are some challenges there that keep us out of these positions? Are you saying like as an asset manager on their own, what kind of returns do they have to get? Yes. Ugh. I mean, there's no a bunch of creative investors here. I know. I'm like, own. there's no way we could have created a portfolio like without, without beating a benchmark. You got to beat the benchmark and it just depends on what your benchmark is. Um, so like with us, we're always looking like, how are we doing compared to, um, a global all cap benchmark um, when we look at JSTC. I mean, you're, you're gonna have to beat it, um, but those benchmarks change every year, depending on whether you're looking at the S&P 500, which is all US and large cap, or if you're looking at the FTSE all cap global, right? So um, I don't, that's true for any asset manager. And I think it's crazy unfortunate and also still true that um, just like when you see a black woman that's a surgeon, like you know she's the best yeah. surgeon in her class you know she was because she had to be. It's very similar. Like you have to, you have to kind of outperform. Thankfully, um, we're very data analytics based. So if people are fine with crunching numbers, have social justice chops, 
um, and uh, know how to communicate well. Um, we have hired lots of people who don't all haven't already managed portfolios and haven't already delivered huge returns. We've hired plenty of people um, just because they have the basic skills that are required. And because that actually matters most of all, the intersection between racial justice and financial markets is, has basically been non-existent before Adesina. So if you have that intersection, if you've been listening to this show, right, and you have some background in finance, yeah, um, you know, reach out to Make us. it higher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. reach out to us. It's a rare skill set to overlap there. There you have it. Graduated Market Mondays University with honors. Fact. Um, you too <laughs> can be a wealth manager. Uh, can we get some questions? Let's do it. Let's do it. Jan, you here? Hi, guys. Hello, everyone. Janet. Hi, Rachel. How are you? Good to How see are you. you. How I'm are good. You? How are you? Long time no see. Good I know, to see you right? again. <laughs> yes, Jan. Right. Been, been a long time. <laughs> Jan pulled up on us. New York City. I know it was well. great. Had a blast. Yeah, it was a birthday party, Troy. Celebrating <laughs> you. Shout out to you. And Blessings. Ian, I got to hang out with you as well. Yeah, it was fun. It was a good Can't time. wait to do it again. Definitely. Yes. What we got, Jan? Right. Right, let's get into some questions. I know we don't have a lot of time. Jonathan, we're coming to you. Unmute yourself, please. Hear me? Yep. Yes, yeah, we hear you. Cool, cool. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, my question, um, I wanted to ask, uh, like with the, the rise in like oil futures and with the continuing conflict in Europe, what impact do you see this actually having on EV, like the electric vehicle stocks? And are there um, any particular stocks you would say we should be paying attention to? I am limited in what I am allowed to say in terms of particular stocks, because what I say could actually um, have an impact on market movement there. But um Anytime you have a reduction, a a steep reduction in supply, you're going to have the price hikes that we're already seeing. Um, In ESG kinds of portfolios, one of the more interesting things that you're going to see happening and is already is a reconsideration of whether or not um, defense contractors should be part of ESG portfolios. They're not weapons and, and defense are not part of our portfolios at all. We don't think that's the purview of financial markets. I don't want to put profit motives behind creating more weapons. What you need is just the right amount and the government that determines and funds that. Um, you don't need to put capital behind it. That's how we got mass incarceration um, is putting profit motives behind it. So you'll see a lot of ESG turning toward looking at weapons and defense. That Those have already been the conversations that are happening um, based on the recent conflict. Um, but you're oil and in the short term, you're going to have price fluctuations, but in the long term, it's a limited resource. It's not really a sustainable investment and it's not something that you'll end up finding in, in our portfolios. So it all depends on if you're looking for the short term or the long term gain. Good. Yes. Good question. Troy, Ian, do you have want to chime in on that question? Um, yes. Uh, crude futures, of course, crude prices will continue to go up for a little bit. And, and also that's one of the signs of a looming recession, like when oil prices jump this fast, it is a lagging indicator of uh, recession could be here. Long term, if you believe in EV, I wouldn't change the stance now. If you're looking five, 10 years out, you'll be fine. Truth be told, the oil companies are going to invest heavily into EV. Um, so there, there is a arbitrage play that you can have there between Chevron, Exxon, Exxon. Tesla, Ford as well. Yeah. Like, like all the big money players are going to put their money into the assets that are going to make them the most money. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we've been saying that for the you know, past two years, you know, every, every state, uh, California is leading the way, right? With 2035, everything zero emissions. So I, I think we, we have time before the EV market is becomes a commonplace. Um, so the, the typical ones that we've we spoken about, obviously Tesla is leading that pack. Um, but you can see every, every automotive company going to that space. Mercedes yeah. is doing it. Ford is doing it. So just, just keep your eyes on them. Yeah, and I want to give you guys a comparison. Like, notice when 15 years ago it wasn't popular to be vegetarian. Now, like, mm-hmm. Burger King has a McVegan Whopper. Now, like, <laughs> McVegan Whopper. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Mike clipped it up. Um, at some point, even the companies that are not, and, and she touched on it tonight, companies that are not truly, that don't care about social justice or the environment, they will begin to market themselves as that. You will see the same thing in EV. Mm-hmm. You're going to see oil companies and, you know, companies that have, that have damaged the earth 
then yeah. tell you, hey, we, we've learned from our mistakes from 80 years and we're not going to make a change, but for profit. Yeah, uh, a, a, the 100 year mistake and, and now we, we figured it out. I'm sorry. If oh, I no, no, go for it. No, no, I completely agree. Um, In the long term, I think that, I mean, EV is going to continue to be something that has a lot of growth potential. But one of the things that you have to do is not, if you're really wanting to be a values aligned investor and really take advantage of those social justice premiums I talked about, you have to look not just across climate, but like, you know, when we took a look at certain companies, they weren't good on racial and gender justice, some very prominent companies. So, um, you know, that's something that we took a look at. And so you have to pass all of the metrics in our portfolio. So take that into consideration if you're trying to do values alignment. It's not let a company in on one, but... Um, yeah, but ignore some of the other factors. That happens a lot. To play devil's advocate and to also advocate for you, does investing in social justice projects produce a higher alpha than the companies that have historically maybe been slightly more prejudiced? I'm trying to step on eggshells so they don't put this up <laughs> and use this against you. Absolutely. I, I mean, as uh, Dr. King said, you know, the long arc of history bends toward justice. I mean, I want to be on that. Right, like we wanna be yeah. investing in the way of the future. All we've done is actually move more in that direction. And so I think it just makes sense to be invested in companies that get that. And when they get it, they have to be pretty intentional about it because we're no joke. Um, speaking of the New York Times, they when they interviewed us um, in the past, like they, they've said like it is the most rigorous set of screens they've ever seen. So, um, you know, be rigorous, stay true to your values. And I actually really do, you can see if you, if you go to our website, you can go to also take a closer look at our index. You can take a look at how our index tracks relative to um, the FTSE All Cap Global, and you can see over time how we're trending um, and that there's some real premiums there. Yeah, I got I got the criteria right in front of me right now. All 61 measurements. Yeah, this is this, is, this, this is rigorous. <laughs> yes, yes it is. Yeah, you have to be pretty intentional as a company to pass all those. Yep. Next question. Appreciate you, John. What we got? I can I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We hear you. What's yes. up? What's up? What's up? Um, all right. So my question is: so I got I'm holding Boo and VTI, and I just wanted to know, would it be smart to switch it out for an like an alternative like like Boo for SPLG, which they basically got like the same holdings, but it's just a cheaper price. If that makes sense. Ian, you want to take that one? Yes, um, I would have you research who the backing from SPLG. It, just because it's cheaper doesn't mean that it's better. I don't work for Vanguard. I get no inducements, no money incentives to endorse them. Um, but yes, if you like the formulation of that index and the price, and I don't want you guys to look at price only, um, but if you like it based on your research, then yes, SPLG is definitely a good offering that you can use as a, as a backup to VO or VTI. Okay, thank you. There you thank have you. it, there you have it. Do you get another question, Janet? Yes, Darlene, we are coming to you. I'll meet yourself, please. Hi, um, Rachel, thank you so much for teaching us so much tonight. Um, I'm going to be, um, exploring and learning more about so many of the topics you've been talking about, which were completely unaware to me uh, in the depth that you've described them. Um, I have a question about the commodities um, play that uh, Ian was mentioning. Uh, how do you best invest in commodities if you want to diversify? You know, I've heard and read that gold ETFs are not a great way of getting the diversification that you know gold is said to um, provide because it's more like a stock. So, do you just get physical gold? And if is that concern true for other commodities like nickel and silver? And how do we invest in these commodities in a way that actually gives you the diversifications that they're supposed to? Darlene, that is a great question. And I'm going to do something that asset managers rarely do, which is admit when I am out of my depth. 
Um, we are, we do um, long only publicly traded companies and we do municipal bonds. That's my specialty. And that's what most people need in their portfolios because the long-term movement of commodities, commodities have often a lot more um, volatility in them. And so what we were doing is really looking at core portfolio strategies. So I'm wondering, Ian, if you want to take a, take a stab at that. Yeah, it's tough because if you have, if you have had gold or silver in your portfolio the last two years, you may or bonds, you may not have like the return uh, until the last maybe two or three months. So it really depends on what your risk tolerance is. Um, maybe five to 15% as a hedge as something that's okay. Physical gold. No, I know everyone, and this is my take. This is not the Queens take Janet's Troy or Rashad's. If we go into a walking dead scenario, do you think that gold bars are actually the most important thing that you're going to need? No. Um, and whenever I talk to anyone at a hedge fund, I ask them, do they have physical gold on hand? They're, they laugh at me every time I ask it. So no, th that isn't the best strategic move that I would want you to make. And I know it feels like hell is on, I mean, uh, hell is falling on earth right now. And maybe two or three years, um, you won't even care about this or won't even consider investing in gold at that point, but maybe do five to 15% if you need to as a hedge. And then also if you need to look at the all weather portfolio um, from Ray Dalio, you can check that out and see if that allocation works well for you. I'm personally not invested in gold or silver, um, but that's just based on my personal risk tolerance. And then also being able to invest short-term and long-term to be able to hedge um, that way. So I'm sorry, it's not as clear of an answer that you may have wanted, wanted to be given, but it's just the, the truth of how I approach the market. We're just in a sticky time. Um, cause it look, it would be genius insight to say, Hey, two weeks ago, invest in oil and gold. And then when the market goes back to normal and you draw down, you're going to hate us. So I'm going to say, stick with the plan and don't, don't deviate from it yet. And if you want to, if you want some more information on that, we actually did an episode on wall street trapper a year ago. And in that episode, he actually spoke about investing in physical gold because he actually has some like gold bars. Mm -hmm. And he told it's like a 10 minute segment. Um, so it's a good reference point where he talked about how to buy physical gold bars, how to insure it, um, how to keep it safe. It's a whole it's a whole conversation yeah. that we had about that. Yeah, is, Safety it, deposit box. It's in, inside the, the blueprint. Yes. Well, the family pack. Yeah, the family pack. It is inside the family pack. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I and, forgot about actually, that. For 20 years, people have been running the gold. You know, I was a wealth manager before I was, you know, just did the asset management for 20, you know, 20 years. I've been seeing people running the gold. No one's ever really ultimately um, turned out to be happy with that choice long term. It's like it's kind of like a backup behavior that we all do trying to run the gold because we aren't trusting what's happening with currencies. But in reality, gold is just something we all decided had value the same way the paper or the decimals in the bank account are. So it doesn't end up protecting you from a lot. Yep. And also, the, the gold bugs that promote gold, please go look and see what they're invested in, because a lot of times when, when crashes happen or harsh pullbacks, you're going to see a lot of content around investing in gold, but you have to be mindful to see what their motive is. Um, and also, go look at the 15-year, the 10-year return of gold and see if you would like to hold that in your possession as a result and what the drawdown is as well. I'm going to give you your answer. My best investment this year. So far, go roll it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> yes. Now we know what to think about that. That is, that is my best <laughs> investment this year so far. Appreciated twenty thousand dollars as soon as I got it. My, I, mine was a twelve thousand dollar appreciation. Not, not as great as yours, but still an appreciation nonetheless. An appreciation nonetheless. Over I ten years. I'm begging you. At yes, least. At at minimum. Least. Pass it down to your children. Well, I don't sell. I don't sell investments. That's why we call them. Long That's long. the lesson you guys need to write down. All asset classes as well. Please hold for infinity. I know it's not the sexy thing. It won't help you flip. And you can't go get the Maybach truck tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's hold not, but infinity. it's it's actually it, that's the one thing because I had to work up with directly advising wealthy people for many years. That's the one thing that they are able to be that those who are wealthy can't be is patient. That is the number one thing. Like, can you afford to be patient and stick with it? The That's market the pays the those term. who are patient. Mm -hmm. what, what, can I ask you, uh, what, what are like the two biggest lessons from the wealthiest clients that you've had? Uh, what lessons, jewels, gems, insights uh, have you gleaned for them that you can share to the audience tonight? I'm going to sound the a real stuff. Bit, I, I'm like, no, real. 
um, because I've been with clients um, that have been through a lot. You know, the number one thing that I've learned is that money is super important. Like resources are really important, but money isn't actually in the end what ends up buying a security community is. It's community in the end. It's actually who you've invested in that ultimately makes the difference when your health is down and out, when you're having trouble with your family, when all of these things, like when money can't come in and save you, I have had client after client after client crying their eyes out with millions of dollars in the bank account, nothing the money can do to help. So, you know, as you're investing your dollars, make sure you're investing in your community. That's the only real security we have. You know, if the whole financial system goes under is community and, you know, we're wealthy in that way in the black community, you know, the white folks may have gotten the resources, um, but we got community. That was something that could never be taken away. And it's, and you see it play out with those wealthy folks. And they'll tell you that that's the truth. Yep. That's why I always tell you guys, you'll climb up this mountain and you'll hit this magical number that you think will make you happy. And then you'll be like, man, I really want a peace, love, serenity, friendship, family, yep. joy, and happiness. But you Every don't really time. realize it till you get to that number. And I was the same one watching YouTube. Like, if I hit that number, I'm going to have full of joy. You guys saw me hit the number. I don't have true joy. I'm working on it. <laughs> Right. So I'm telling good. you, you're going to hit the top of this mountain and then be like, man, that's it. Put yes in chat. If some of you have hit your financial goal and you hit it and was like, damn, I'm disappointed. I thought I was going to feel more complete, more loved, more happy, more fulfilled. It's not it. It's just right. Community. Uh, so just invest in both. I want to say like, don't, don't not invest financially, but invest in both because you'll need both later on. Bible lesson. Valuable lesson. I like that. Yes, community. In our community, we are heavily invested in our community. This is true. That's a this fact. Is true. Yeah. This is true. That is a fact. Um, okay, let's get maybe two more questions before we before we call it a night. All right. Eden, I'm yourself. Good evening. Thank you for uh being here, Rachel. It's awesome. Thanks, you guys, for all you do. Um I had uh, just a quick question about um, once you're over, okay, if let's say TD Ameritrade, I think uh, they have a limit for, I think 550,000 that you can have prior to FDIC insurance is no longer applicable. Once you go over that point, what do you do? What, how, how are you able to transfer funds? Do you just open multiple accounts and that's how it works or what's the, I, I think, and Rachel, correct me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. but I think, I think the bank is 250,000, but for brokerage, not, nothing is um, FDIC short for an investment. Um, that's correct, Rachel. Yeah. He's talking about the SIPC insurance, which is yeah. much more limited. You're correct. On, on the money, the F- on the money market. Insurance. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. So there isn't much you can do. And that SIPC insurance really only takes care of you in the case of fraud or, yeah. And this nah. is, you always got to look at like, what can, what's the worst that can happen? And anything can happen. You you all, yeah, get, I always expected it. Charlie, please drive that home. Oh my, yes. Anything can happen. That is a fact. So, um, you know, it's even like this, there's lessons and everything and like just strategically how Putin's been able to kind of hide his money. And there's so much stuff that I'm, I'm even learning, like from a sophisticated standpoint of like different places, people, it's like, it's, this wealth game is a whole it's a whole system. It's levels. Like, I mean, like there's big levels that people take to, you know, protect their assets, put it in trust and take it out their name and offshore account. There's so much different mm-hmm. stuff. Cause it's like, you know, ultimately nobody's more powerful than the government. And if the government wants to freeze your money, whether it's the IRS, whether it's, you know, whatever it's over. Yeah. It's over. It's levels. No, it's really over. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. They could take your house. Mm-hmm. They could take your bank account. They can even take your crypto if they get access to it. So yes. it's not decentralized as much as you guys think. I'm telling you, please be mindful. Hard wallet yeah. stores, but please be mindful. If things get really bad in this country and others, you will see your assets and crypto be stolen. Yeah, there's, there's a reason that they reached out to Brian Armstrong from Coinbase. There's a reason, right? Like there's a, there's a possibility that they could freeze accounts. So. Be very mindful of that. And it's one of these things where it's like, um, you know, there was a rush on, on banks a few years ago, I think in Greece, and everybody was like panicking. And 
you know, it's one of these things that like that can never really happen in America. When, well, you know, it can never happen until it happens. Be mindful. Be mindful. <laughs> that's, that's real. It's real, though, that's right? Real, it's, 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 it's always it's always a conspiracy theory yeah. until it happens. Right. Sure, now it's fitness is the financial I, That's why I said, like, I, I think the point that, <laughs> that you made that super important is, like, the levels to this, man. Like, no, that's a lot of levels. There's so many levels of, uh, like, we're just learning from, like, what's happening. Even, like, when we had the conversation about the SWIFT system, it was, like, with, are people even familiar with, like, how that works and how you can be kicked off of that and how Russia got kicked off? And it's like, all right, well, they're going to find another way. And then finding out how, allegedly, that the money's being moved and where it got moved and who moved it and how they, it's like, wait, this level, like, we had no idea. But this is a big game out the here. World, the that, world that bank we are, is, the that world we are aware system of. is extremely complex, and it's extremely it's ex- like you can just spend a year just learning about all of these different world banks and the world banking system and the Swiss banking. It's just so much stuff, and it's it's like a whole. Now I understand why you know lawyers and and financial experts and why these people you know they have a place because um. You know, you really can't gain this much information just by yourself. You have to actually be taught or have somebody around you that actually knows what they're doing. Yeah. Because, um, you know, especially when you start to deal with like real money, it, it's just, it's just, it just changes. Yeah. It really changes. If I can ask really quickly, Rachel, for your ETF, is there any like risk mitigation procedures or protocols that you have in place, like in case China does try and invade? U.S. Like, what what risk mitigation factors do you have in place to protect those that are investing in your ETF? So, well, I mean, it's really interesting that we actually have a specific China researcher, and we are we frown upon companies that are just instruments of the government. We really expect like clear separation through governance. So I believe that there's a lot of um, risk mitigation already happening just with our deep screening process. I mean, I have to tell you, we had one Russian company in the portfolio that we took a closer look at before the invasion. We're one of the only asset managers I saw whose trades cleared out of Russian companies because, you know, all the markets shut down. So I do think that actually looking at these early indicators like surveillance, you know, we know how it's treated here in the United States, but it's bad everywhere. So if you're looking at, you know, the, the kind of com- the kind of country that will you know, engage in surveillance and co-opt a private company in order to do that, right? I mean, like, you're going to have lots of issues with companies um, in that particular country. And that's why we have a special researcher just for that region. So. Are there any Russian or Chinese companies that are publicly traded that you love? <laughs> no. I know you can. not <laughs> <laughs> look inside ask. the holding, <laughs> <end>. If not, <laughs> they're going to kill you. <laughs> No, there, there are some in the portfolio. There's, there's some cool companies. Um, there's some cool ones in, inside the portfolio. I love. Yes, Go look at there, the whole There group. are a few cool companies in the portfolio, but uh, yeah, no, not, not in my favorites list per se. We got you, Rachel. Let's get. Can we get one more question, Janet? Before we, before we. Um, sure, James Moore. We are coming to you. Hey, peace, peace. What's going on? Can y'all hear me? What's going, What's going on? on, James? Hey. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Ian uh, for the two tech two index. Um, what is like the best way to take advantage of that using your Roth? So, you know, because it's only like a six thousand six thousand dollars. Yeah, six thousand not a cap. And um, just a question, all in hold to everybody is, uh, what do y'all recommend doing with puts during like a recession? Um, well, we have an amazing advisor here. I'll let Rashad take the the Roth question, um, but if you message me privately via email, I'll be sure to get back to you tonight about it as well. And on the put side, I will say, please be careful. Put, and if you guys are going to do puts, limit it to three, and you have to know what the institutional levels are, where they're going to exit. If you don't, and I would argue from the trader's perspective, that is almost as important as knowing the yield curve and when quantitative easing starts or ends. Because if you buy puts at the wrong time and this market reverses, bye bye yeah, account. That's risky stuff. Please, <laughs> Queen, tell them yeah, they don't want to hear from me. Be careful. No, no, definitely be careful with that. You can really, yeah, lose quite a bit of money that way. Thank you. Thank you, gang. Thank you so much. Don't lose your shirt out here, man. It's yeah. Real. And um, as far as the two tech two index, I mean, 6,000, you could just divide it by four, put $1,500 in, in Apple, $1,500 in. Microsoft, $1,500 in VOO, 
fifteen hundred dollars in VTI. That's the one that Ian talks about all the time. So you can just put, you know, fifteen hundred dollars in each one of those, and uh, you know, divide up that six thousand dollars and just move forward that way. I have a question for Rachel. How do you feel about the two tech and two index uh, strategy, and how urgent is it for us to move over to more socially justice investing as people of color? It's a great counter question, Janet. What was the beginning? You said, "How do I feel about the?" So, 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 Ian, yeah. yeah, Ian, I'll give some reference. So, Ian has a strategy where he he tells people to invest in two tech and two index. So, two technology companies ah. like Microsoft and Apple, Apple Microsoft, yeah. and then two indexes like uh you know s p 500 mm-hmm. or jstc something like that perhaps yes. perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. something like that <laughs> yeah same yeah. That, so yeah that's the strategy it seems like what ian's up to is um trying to make sure that you have a good solid footing on the index side and then giving you a little bit of room to play and i think that for people to stay really interested and engaged with their investing investing that is an important strategy. Like if you just go all the boring direction of, you know, going all index investing, I think people can like lose touch and lose enthusiasm for it. I heard you earlier, Ian, talking about like, you know, pay attention because this can like ruin your confidence and your your balance. So um, in the account. So I actually think that it's a good strategy. I would just make sure that the two tech companies that you have, you're investing with it, money that's not part of your core strategy long-term, right? Because the last part again. Pardon me? Can you say the last part one more time? Sure. The yeah. The two easy. tech, like if you, um, if you know, you need to hit a certain number that you're saving in order to like kind of hit whatever the goal is. And then I would do that with the extra funds that you're putting towards gotcha. the goal, not necessarily yeah. the core. I would do all index for the core. And unfortunately, most of the indexes are investing like there's, I can, I'll find it on our website now that I figured out the chat function. Um, most of the indexes have various investments along the mass incarceration path and private prisons. I think it's, we have so much money that we are like sitting on and so much of the American public is just mindlessly investing in indexes. I will put in that race and finance. We wrote a whole series. Um, that I think you can inadvertently, if you're invested in a standard index, you will inadvertently be investing in whole systems that are doing nothing good for you, like as a member of the black community or just, you know, anybody. We had this conversation? I feel like it's tough because we wanna like make as much money in the market as possible. And we need to make that money to catch up. But at the same time, you know, there's all these social justice and, you know, issues that we have to look at too. So. Yes, I don't, but I don't actually, I'm, I'm showing you like that you don't actually have to give up returns. This is actually how you get the stable long-term return. There's just a big difference. You have to like widen the scope of like how, what the term is that you're looking at. If you're a long-term investor, this is the only way to go, right? Mm-hmm. Why would, you know, there's like, I, I just have to ask people like, why would you invest in a business that's based on a resource that's going to stop coming out of the ground? Why would you base a whole business or why would you base your future on a business that's mistreating people in whole communities, right? Like ultimately things that are unethical become illegal and you don't want to be caught holding the bag when that happens. Like Mm -hmm. if, if we believe that the long arc of history is bending toward justice. So I actually think it's just a good risk mitigation strategy long-term. I don't, it's no longer the case that you have to give up a lot of return right? Just to be investing in alignment with your values. There's really smart people doing the work now who can find ways to maximize the return for you. Are there any top 20 publicly traded companies that are clean per se, quote unquote? Well, I can't, I have to be so. I know. I wish you can. In private, this conversation would be incredible. I have to be so careful with what I say. There are, but take a look at our index. If you go to our um, website, so all of the constituents in the ETF are listed on the ETF website. And then we have an index, um, the the Adesina Social Justice Index that we're tracking. And um, you can, there there are many companies that are doing the right thing. They have to be pretty intentional to do it because they have to hit all of those metrics. They have to be, you know, good to all the communities and not extracting from people on the planet. In the end, is it way better if you invest in a small business that's doing something directly impactful, like you'll probably have a greater impact that way. But what we're trying to do by investing in publicly traded companies is um, shift the levers of power. Because it's the public companies that are the greatest actors in our society 
And I don't know about y'all, but I'm a little tired of waiting for Congress to figure things out. You know, in the meantime, as the shareholders of these companies, we can actually have a lot more of an impact that way. And yeah. that's something that we're about and up to. Ian, there's, there's a top 10 in there that the, the that's inside of their holdings uh, that we speak about all the time. You know, they may have had a split last year. So um, good Thank for them. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Rachel, it's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Please come back. Are you coming to Are you coming to Texas? Um, no, not to South by Southwest. Uh, I, I think it didn't work out. Okay. But um, but I would love to see y'all. And I think that maybe the event I was going to come to like got rerouted. Yeah, the, so den- the, yeah the dinner situation. We had that. We had the yeah that was put on ice. But uh, okay. I got yeah, you. But we're going to be in Texas twice. Okay. So. Well, let me know. I love this community. It's so supportive. Uh, I don't get to, I, I talk to, as you can imagine, the asset management industry is, is full of folks that don't look like me. So I talk to rooms full of people uh, that look like the characters on Mad Men um, and not like, they're not like all y'all. So it feels really good and welcoming to love just you. talk to people you're that amazing. I know already get it. It's just, it's beautiful what you're doing. You make this work really accessible and you're answering people's real questions so i just have a lot of respect for what you're doing too thank you no i appreciate Everyone you. put rachel in chat she's absolutely amazing please come back with rachel i mean to cut you off but i do want to give the queen her flowers please show her love please put her name in chat how much do you want us to invest per person um between red panda and, and the earners i'm sure we can how many people capital. do we have like i'm like you know, we, we got a few, you know, a hundred thousand, a couple, few, couple hundred thousand that we can deliver. I would we say, get no money on the back uh, end. We're doing it for the culture. Might clip this part up. Culture with a K. Yeah. I would say um, invest in an amount that actually makes you excited. Like don't invest in an amount that's like, oh, you'll forget about it. I actually want you to go back and check on it. See how we're doing. Be actually invested in our success. And that's going to be different for everybody. So I want you to actually feel something when you invest. Done. So, you know, if $5,000 doesn't make you kind of like a little queasy when you invest it, then, you know, increase that amount. Done. Yeah, you have it, ladies Done. and gentlemen. Um, can you give the, the information, social media or website again before, before you? Absolutely, because I have figured this. Okay, so my Twitter handle is at our Robichotti, um, and on LinkedIn, somebody was so kind to put it in the chat earlier. Um, I'm Rachel, I'm under Rachel Robichotti at LinkedIn, um, which apparently I did not come with all my handles ready. LinkedIn, That's not a good idea. The the professional the professional way to I social network. Yeah. I know, the like everybody's like, what? LinkedIn. I know. I'm getting up on the Instagram. Y'all, let me know that like I need to get up on Instagram. So, I am. And see, look, my Instagram account's there. I just don't visit it very often. Um, and thank you, Dan P, for putting all my links up. Dan, you're amazing. Well, oh, shout out to Dan. I was just putting Dan, shout out to you. Shout yeah. out to Dan. And then oh, what's, what's the website? Adesina.com, A D A S I N A. And then it's uh, text the word justice to 55444 if you want to sign up for the newsletter and you'll get all the latest on what we're up to. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Rachel, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Feel free to come back anytime. Oh, shout out to Josh Brown, too. Yeah, absolutely. He, yes, he connected it. Yeah, yeah. He, connect, he connected the dots on this situation. So shout out to Josh. Market Monday's vet. Yes, shout out to Josh. Um, all right, Rachel. Rachel come we, back, we're, please. We're going to wrap up a yes, little bit, okay. but um, I'll, I'll let you go and enjoy your evening in California. Thank you. Yes. All right, right y'all. There, have a good one. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Round of applause for Rachel. Great uh, guest. A very educational episode. Very high level conversation. That was a classic. Um, yeah. Yes, definitely. Classic, yeah. Definitely. Classic. I knew I knew once I spoke to her on the Zoom call that, you know, it was going to be a very, very. That was a, that was a great call. That, that, that was call classic. was insightful. Yeah. yeah. It was like an hour and a half. We were just talking. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Rachel. That's how I felt when you brought that beanie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very important Top moment. Top five. Instance. Gift ever. Those of y'all didn't see what he had on. Top Something. one outfit. <laughs> History. Maybe. History. I said this is more about our beanie and you know, <laughs> you, 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 you going up. Fashion week. 
going up. Shout out to Siegel, man. <laughs> you guys <laughs> loved art. You got a lot of you learned about Kathy through me. Please consider investing in this Queens fund. For those those of you that are women, I tried to get the answer out of her. The real answer is if you're black and want to break into the industry, your returns are going to have to be three times higher to get the same job. I understand the playing field, but if you can help if we can have a sustainable version of art with her. And I'm going to ask you guys to do me a favor. I have no inducement, no equity in her in her fund. Please go support her. If I want something for the culture, go support her. And I want to see us pile in and help her build her fund the same way everybody helped build Kathy's fund. That's all I ask for free. So I ask you yeah. like Raphael said, we, we've, we've been called. Yes, We've yes. Shout out to Rachel. Great guest. Uh, MG the mortgage guy. Been going crazy on a super chat. Shout out to MG. Matt Garland, I love you. I appreciate you. Hi, Matthew. Appreciate it, bro. <laughs> Branson Jim's dropping next Wednesday, and you know <laughs> I will be ranting. <laughs> Matt, I need to come back every month so I can be diplomatic here. <laughs> we go. Shout out to everybody in London. Are you with Anya Leisure? Oh, amazing. <laughs> I can't wait to go back to London. Anya on London Leisure. Water. Oh my God. Oh my God. Are you the master investor? Me? My <laughs> London's a honor. Vibe. London's a vibe, vibe, man. Small said he's he's moving to London. He said he's going to move to London. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> and I know y'all get mad when I say it. It's, it's a, I'm not going to say it. Yo, man's them come back real soon. Yeah. yeah. London's up there. Bro. Man's them coming back. I'm not even going to sit here and lie to top. you. It's top. It's top. Boy. It's Man's top. them coming no back. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Pay me in pounds. That's my new slogan. Facts. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay me in pounds, please. Yeah. London was about. Uh, London's up there, man. Can't wait to come back. Yep. Um, okay. Well, earners, Rep Band of Family, we want to let you know about a great choice if you're looking to bank or invest. Our good friends over at Ally are the leading digital financial service company with passionate customer service, innovative financial solutions, and are relentlessly focused on doing it right for both customers and our communities. Get with allies so that you can save, invest, and spend on the things that matter most to you. For everything we need, we're all better off with an ally. Shout out to the folks at Ally. We will be at South by Southwest. Yeah. Thursday, Classic performance. The 17th, y'all. Speaking of that. And Pull up. Yeah, before we go, March 17th, South by Southwest, EYO, United Masters, sponsored by Ally, Web 3.0 conversation with John Henry, our guy Buster. We're going to have a fireside chat with Bun B. Uh, Toby Wigway uh, will be performing, DJ Michael Watts, and of course, for the first time ever in history, Ian Dunlap and Wall Street Trapper will be doing- I'm not going to hype it. I'm not going to hype it. <laughs> on, on, on stage <laughs> together, on stage together, fireside chat about it's, investing, the, got, the holy like the trinity. Of both worlds right here. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to be a versus. It's going to be what, if Big and Pop did an album with Jay and Nas, it's, it's going to be that. I'm gonna get to produce. I'm telling this one. you. <laughs> I'm telling you. Gonna Y'all think magical. I went crazy in the Vest Fest? Oh, baby. Gonna be a magical night. So, RSVP, RSVP, links on our website, South by Southwest, Austin, Texas. We'll see you guys next Thursday. Can't wait. Um, yeah, my first time in South by Southwest. So, I'm yeah, excited first. just yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. check the vibe and just, you know, a lot of dope stuff going on too. Hopefully, we get to check out some of, some of that. Uh, other activations uh, when we get out there. It's going to be uh, an event. I think Anytime com- we come to a, a place, it's an event. I think Complex is having an activation. Yeah, we're uh, going we to we be outside. Yeah, it's going to be the back outside tour. Never, I mean, you never no, left. We, we can't see it. Uh, oh, we can't JP see Morgan, Guide to the Markets. Go download the PDF and go review. Homework assignment for tonight. Um, for those of you who need some added uh, material. And also, too, I would love to see 50 people from Red Panda and 50 earners end up working at her firm. For those of you in Red Panda that have been invested long-term in earners, please send me uh, your long-term results. That's why execution matters. I promise you. And I'm going to put them on the spot. I'm going to make sure we push to help get some of y'all some jobs there. If you have great returns, now we're going to get to see who executes. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more thing. I want to shout out our regional clubs are meeting this weekend um and all over the nation and discussing real estate so how they can partner together and things like that so shout out to all the earners uh check out the email we sent out today for more details yeah 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 shout out to all the earners i see in in the chat somebody said there's an la meetup shout out to all the earners out there and shout out to to mg i gotta shout him out again 
Uh, pulled up to his uh, his Rancid Gym live in Brooklyn. Dope event. Shout out to Drew Bernard, alumni from EYL. When's the LA? Um, when's the LA meetup? Uh, I don't. I, I was looking. I was trying to figure out when it was. Sometime this weekend. There's Sometime this weekend. The 11 okay. to the 13th. So they're. <laughs> We're going to be sliding through there. You guys will be there? We'll no, 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 no. We're going to be sliding uh, through LA a little I bit mean, later in the month. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They said March 12th. Okay. We'll be the next week. We'll be the next week after that. Yeah, we're we going from... The 20th. From, yeah, like the 21st or something like that. Yeah. Um, Very important episode tomorrow. Jeremy Anderson. Uh, how to break into the world of uh public speaking. Yeah. A lot of money. Billion dollar industry. Yeah. A Shout lot out. of money. A lot of people, if you didn't watch that Rupin Harris episode, you're doing yourself a tremendous disservice. I'm going to take that from Shadi. Please go back and watch that. That, Well, you know, it's one of these crazy, things where we had a crazy. lot of entertainers, a lot of rappers, and be diplomatic. Pe- people's like, um, <laughs> like, you know, you have like, well, is, is this million dollars worth of game? Why I got all these entertainers? Well, you only watch when the entertainers come on. And then when the, when the entrepreneurs come on, that's given a million dollars worth of game. Trillion. And, In and, real life. Yeah, not you know not, what that boy did. Yeah, not yeah, not some yo. Ruben yeah. is different. You're not supporting it, man. You're not supporting it the same way. If it was Shaq or if it was Rick Ross, shout out to all of them. But I mean, you know, the numbers are the numbers. So can you tell them where he got funding from? Uh he, well, he's a Y Combinator mm-hmm. uh, First. graduate, yeah. and then he got um funding from. That's like getting money from Goldman. Yeah. Yeah. Max. Yeah. Why Combinator is not easy to pass, especially if you're black. I'm going no. to do a promo for them. If you go learn how to master public speaking and then go to Y Combinator and get funding, you have you would have earned your leisure for sure. Like yeah. it's a lot of high level. Com- it's a lot of high level conversations that we had so far this year. We had him. We had um, the other tech startup uh, crowdfunding. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was two weeks ago. Um, it was just a lot of like, you know, really high level like investment conversations. I don't think people fully appreciate it. Like this is literally like college I courses. Have went tri- no, no, no. MBA. I'm going to be real. Yeah. Even un- up until maybe the last two or three years, Calicanus, Chamoth, Peter Thiel wasn't really discussing how to break that code at Y Combat. That was, that was a boys club for real. That's why like my respect for John Henry, those who made it through that ecosystem got funding. Um, even the team at Calendly, that's man, that is a tough gamut. Yeah. That's like going pro in the NBA, NFL, MMA, and MLB to get funded from that. It's, it's rare air up there. Please yeah. go check out those episodes. Somebody said, What episode was Ruben? He was last week's episode. Last week's episode. So you still that's got time. Be you got time to watch it. Go, t- got time to listen to it on your way to work before the new one drops tomorrow. All right. So make sure y'all do that. Hey, yo. Real quick, real quick, Ian. I gotta shout out my young boy, uh Darmody. He uh he was in our program when he was 14 years old, our summer internship program. He's now a partner with us in the vending machine company and he started his own clothing line. And so he shipped this to me. I said, Man, I got I'm a I'm aware. I don't want I don't want to just have it. I gotta wear it for you. So shout out to him for creating his own clothing line. What's the site? Uh you gotta go to his Instagram. So Darmody Smith, D-A-R-M-O-N-D-Y Smith um on IG. So shout out to him. He's 18 years old, man. It's, when he was 14, I told him, yo, you're going to be special. And um, just been staying around. And like now, Abdullah is kind of a mentor for him. And so we're going to make, he's he going to be the next one. I'm telling you, this kid is special. Shout out to him. Can yeah. you guys go, um, that are watching on YouTube and then the earners, a Red Panda family. Can you guys go buy all of his merch tonight? And I'll do something special for y'all next week. Please, please. Every Very piece. Important. I don't want him to have Very important. Very important. I have no financial incentive, equity in the company. Very important. Very Let's important. run it up because we have to. We can't say, Hey, how do we close the wealth gap and then don't support this queen and don't support him? Very important. Can yeah. you say, Can you say the Instagram again? Yeah, Dharma D. Smith. Can, can you spell it out? D A. I'm gonna I'm go to his page right now. You got to go know, crazy because you know, you did. You're like, I don't, that's and, not and him. I need an XL, so just send my, <laughs> I'll pay for my shipping. Let me oh, yeah. get my go. <laughs> there you go at D A R M O D Y S. M I T H Dominic Smith. Uh yeah, he's got the <laughs> look at his Instagram. He's wearing the, the actual sweatshirt that I have on. So shout out to him, man. Shout out to Dominic, yeah, man. Yeah. The, the Haitians have invaded the chat. <laughs> I'm not sure where that came from, but shout out to shout out to Haiti. Shout out to all the Haitians. Shout out to little Haiti. Um, and shout out to you know Brooklyn. 
Shout out to uh, Spring Valley. A lot Spring of Haitians Valley. out there. Spring Valley, yeah. Yes. Good people. Um, shout out yeah. the biggest blessing you guys learned tonight. Go ahead, Rashad. H- Haiti, Haiti was the first, um, not, only, not only black country, but the first country in the Western Hemisphere to gain its independence from uh, European colonization. Very historic. And their Independence Day is January 1st, uh, which is our New Year's. Um, yes, very interesting story about mm-hmm. Haiti. Um, one of the only, I think the only successful slave rebellion, rebellion. Yep. um, that led to independence in the history of the world. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. Shout out to all, all our Haitians out there. Very important. And they was in debt to France. So they won their independence from France and France made them pay. <laughs> People is crazy, man. France made them pay. Reparations. Reparations. They paid reparations to France for getting their independence and they just paid it off like 20 years ago. So that's why, you know, you look at that economy and you see the country, you know, is is in such disparate, but it's like they had to pay over, you know, hundreds of years to France. They had to pay reparations for a country that enslaved them just for their independence um, to Napoleon. So, um, so, and and they beat they beat Napoleon's army too. It oh, wasn't man. like you know that was you know the most feared army in the world at the time. So that was a very that was that was a very historical moment for them to defeat a slave uh, army to defeat the Napoleon's France. It's not easy. So this historical, one might, historical fact. It's like when Kanye said, uh, "Bush don't care about black people." <laughs> <laughs> How do we switch positions? But <laughs> yes. issues. I, that boy Kanye forgot that forgot I'm um, Cootie's name. Um, nah, he, <laughs> that was disrespectful. Very disrespectful. I think he was just joking. No, I think he forgot his name at the first. No, he said it three he times. Kept, yeah, he said he the kept, wrong name three times. Said I was, I'm just playing with you, bro. No, nah, I think he forgot the his first name. time. I think like yo, he really messed him up. No, nah, I think he forgot his name. He, he, he apologized. He said, he, my bad, bro. Yeah, I mean, I love you, bro. Nah, was, that was that was a very awkward. I moment. thought it could have got like he's about to put hands. I, yeah, on. I thought hands was about he, to she's get about to get Chicago. He's about to get real Chicago. Like nah, bro, we ain't playing this game with you. Great documentary though. Yeah, you watch all three parts? Nah, I just saw that part. <laughs> so like in, in the barbershop. I was in the barbershop. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part three. How's it going? For, for my entrepreneurs, if you need someone, well, hey, you don't need anyone to believe in your vision, only you and God. But to see Kanye, like Kanye was talking like that when he was the 60th most popular rapper in Chicago. Some people are like, yo, Ye is crazy, right? You have to have a certain belief in yourself that no one else has. Also, parents, let me tell you this the more belief you instill into your children, the more powerful they would be. Mm-hmm. A lot of times, parents, please don't DM me, I'm coming humbly, but a lot of times your kids have not taken flight based on the limitations and words that you've expressed to them. Mm-hmm. Everyone that I know that is incredibly successful, either mom, dad, or both, poured so deeply into him or grandma with affirmations that they can do anything that programs the subconscious and then it began to manifest. So mm-hmm. if your child is not performing at the level that you want to, let's say in school, maybe you should stop telling them that you're not smart or you're dumb or you can't do them. Be very mindful of the words you point to your children because uh, those are the most important investments that, that you have in your possession in your life. So I wanna put that out there, so. All facts, Ian, all facts. I told you the, the first question I asked, I never asked how school was, I always asked how was, what was the best part of today? It could have been like listening to music on the way, or could it? My, my son always says the same thing. Yo, recess. I play tag. But I never. <laughs> we never came with that. I'm like, bro, like tag. That's it. That's the best part. But yo, that's the best part of the day. So like, it's very important the language we use, the affirmations we use, and I think that part that we might even reference inside of the the, the genius uh, documentary was you could see the impact of how much Donda had poured into him. Even that part where they're actually performing. Uh, hey mama together like the fact that she knew every word to it is, the, is the, she was interested Amazing. in what he was doing important to him even like she kept saying Kanye Kanye that affirmation of like yo your name is your name your name is strength right where he could have been like ridiculed for his name or he could have felt a way about having his name it's a very unique name but he, every sentence she said his name just reaffirmed like yo there's strength in it um, so all these little pieces man I, I thought I, I, the documentary was incredible but this is lessons that we can learn as parents yeah, sure. I think uh, that, like I said, I didn't. I saw the part when I was in the barbershop. So I thought about thirty-five minutes, forty minutes. But Rhyme Fest, when Rhyme Fest was like, um, 
he was like, you know, uh, I don't think you should be calling yourself a genius. He was like, you know, I thought you was a genius until I saw Jay-Z and Jay-Z don't write his rhyme. So maybe you're brilliant, but you're not a genius. And Kanye was like, well, why would you say I'm not a genius? So it just goes to show that um, never let somebody else dictate how you feel about yourself. And he was telling them that he wasn't a genius. And obviously everybody knows that Kanye's a genius now. So, um, you know, people always like to, and no, shout out to him. I'm sure he didn't mean any malice by it, but, you know, people always like to tell you what you can do and who you are. And, you know, they put, they put their views on you of how they view you. And if you believe it, then, you know, you're going, you're going to just become whatever they think that you are. But just because somebody thinks, something of you doesn't mean that that's what it is like it matters what you think of yourself and that was something that really stuck out to me because he was literally telling him like you know you're not a genius and Kanye was like I am a genius that's the reason 20 years later 20 years later I had the issue and I love Ron (laughs) Festival like man but be careful that's what I would say couple rules that I have for my friends and dream team a men we're never gonna fall out over women or money third we'll never put each other down always gonna uplift you have to be mindful of your circle. You think I ran crazy on here. The idea is I could tell P, Dom, Dream Team, oh my God, sound crazy. Even some, hey, I took, hey, I shot, yo, I, I, you know, I want to disrupt everything, right? Be mindful of what people say to you when you throw out these crazy ideas. Be mindful. That'll really tell you what people think about. Throw, go text your friend a crazy idea. Yo, I want to make $152 million by next year. See, man, how are you going to do that? They don't love you. Also, women in relationships, you have to be mindful if the man that you're with or the partner that you're with believes, because I'll tell you, one of the reasons I've been able to elevate is deselecting those who were not good for me and then selecting those who were. Sometimes even in your relationship, they don't want to see you soar. Beautiful view up here, though. They don't, they don't want to see you successful. Mm-hmm. What you got to do? They want to see you miserable. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to see you win. So what they, you do? Stay away from they. You got to win. Stay away from they. Be careful. Be what y'all say? These are just jokes for the podcast. Be, no, be mindful be, of be they. Mindful. Be mindful of they. Yeah. Of they. Hashtag. I love y'all. Be mindful. We need to have a queen on every month. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to see us win. Mm-hmm. So we keep winning. So I ate a cheeseburger. You see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Call it. Call it. another person. Deep belief in himself. <laughs> that is a superpower. Superpower. Deep belief, you know, and for all you entrepreneurs are like, yo, I can't get my friends, family. And I was the same way. Man, I want everyone to believe. You don't need anyone to believe in your vision. My gra- like, and, my, and I say this because my parents believed in me. Grandparents believed in me when I was acting real stupid and was lost and trying to figure my way out. Shout out to my cousin, Rick. Um, Ariel West, you could have saw you when I was in town all your trip. Um, but when people pour into you and then it manifests, man, words are incredibly powerful. And, and my grandmother told me before she passed, if, if you have a vision and no one else can see it, it makes it more special because that's a connection between you and God. That's your vision for what he wants you to do. That's right. You don't need people to believe in your vision. Just execute. I have a question for you guys. Do you feel like it's easier to believe in yourself now at this point or like? I, I'm going to be real. I was more audacious <laughs> when I was less known and had less money. Um, I'll be honest with you, Janet. I've always believed in myself. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And so this is not anything new. Like we've always believed like people, I mean, we kind of got this thing in common, me and Shadi for sure. Like there's, there's, there's no ounce of doubt. Like we know that we're going to do something, we're going to do it. And if it don't work, great, we'll do something else. We're just going to keep going at it. Just yeah. that level of confidence. There's no fear. Um, we never, well, we, I've I, noticed I, that working with you guys. <laughs> facts, like Rashad, like, yo, we're going to do something today. I'm like, bro, it's two days. Yeah, we, yeah, yo, we're, we're going to another country tomorrow. Okay, let's do it. That's why I said, like, even to be able to go out and party and entertain, which I know some of you guys see that and think that's the, also, that's a part of business. Seeing yeah. people, for those of you that saw me, be like, damn, you really act like this in real life. Good and bad, right? Um, <laughs> then to come back and I'm like, yo, they shot five episodes. Yo, it's 8.30. Shot got in at 6.30. Bro, don't miss games. That's why I tell you, regardless of what I do, get, I don't You didn't give them context, man. You're supposed to be our intern that day. <laughs> I got fired day one. That's why I run my own company. Oh, baby. Fire day one. I owe money. Matter of fact, shot all you like five more bottles, right? I was like, Trey, man, I'll be the 830 boy. 830 came. I was like, dear heavenly father of Nazareth, please forgive me, Lord, for being this sleepy. How do you do it? Trey, I'm like, I don't know. Yo, you shot t- fire. No, that, was, that was real because 
So when we filmed, shout, shout out to Tape London. That was the club that we did the networking event at. And um, they have a podcast studio too. So um, we, you know, we planned out my birthday um, party at Tape on Sunday and um, we were shooting content. So I'm like, yeah, we're going to be there like 10 o'clock in the morning the next day to shoot content. So they like, yo, you serious? Like, you sure? Like, we're going to have a long night. I'm like, nah, we be there. Like, we be there. Or the lobby, 830. <laughs> yo, yo, let's go. <laughs> Let's go. It don't matter. You yeah, just we, gotta show up. We're doing nine to nine today. What? Nine yeah, to nine? Yeah, did. nine to nine. That's the schedule today. Yeah, we did five episodes that day. That's a hell look for those of you creating content. He just shout out to Corey too. He gave you a schedule. Shout out to 85. I know you guys think this is easy. It is not, even with this. Doing research. Like I'm I didn't even have my bad. I didn't even have a chance to post a flyer for Market Monday today, preparing for the show. Like it, this is a lot of work, but when you do the work consistently over time, the results are there. I promise you. Uh, we got some fire coming too. Fire. Oh, Trust yeah. me. Yeah. More classics, more hits. I can tell you guys miss Market Mondays. We are not going <laughs> to end it. And I'm, I'm, right. I'm fine, but. <laughs> nah, let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's wrap it. Doc Club call will be at 9 30. Yeah, I, I do want to go for another hour, but it's good. It's been, it's been fun, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, Yeah. All right. Tap in. Yeah, man. Again, shout out to everybody that show love for my brother's birthday. That was crazy. Shout out to everybody that showed love for my birthday. We got a couple of 82 babies this year that we're going to be celebrating. Um, one of them is on Which this Which brother right. was it? Was it was it Greg? No, nah, Shadi. Oh. <laughs> I thought you meant like real brothers. We, this this is real brothers. Real brother. so you know. Yo, yeah. the behind the scenes beat. Yo, that, the, I heard about the, the little fight at the end. Boy, you a legend. <laughs> you a legend, boy. <laughs> Mike, clip that up. Oh, who told you about that? Who told you about that? The town told me. What you mean? <laughs> Wait, Back that was a fight? Life. Is this story time? No, no, that's no. Another, we're talking about that. No, another, that's another time. Sponsored, Sponsored by Ally. Ally. Thank you. Sponsored by Ally. Sponsored by Ally. That's why y'all have to talk. Oh, baby. So what, what, stays, what happened in London stays in London, man. Oh, tape, baby. Uh, just know. Tape made me do it. Just, just know. Sorry. London. Legend. London is legend. London is crazy. legend. Crazy. Legend. Legend. A brawl like Royal Rumble. Yo, crazy. Shout out to shout out to Bam who just had an impromptu to concert outside when that happened. Just started singing happy birthday. <laughs> shout out crazy. Bam. I love you. <laughs> I didn't mean that. My words slipped, King. I'm sorry. I felt like Rogan in the lobby. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say it like that. You know, my words prior to were not of that. Sorry, uh, man. That was I almost forgot about that. That was crazy. Oh man. Yo, and I man. said it so <laughs> boldly. Anyway, yeah, that was an interesting night. Yeah, good, good times. Good shout times, out to everybody. Like I said, we got another eighty-two baby here, and uh, we're gonna go up again. This this, this is gonna be a, a year of celebrations. What should we do in August for my birthday? Pandas, uh, Aaron has put in chat. Oh, we going up. We going up for sure. Mega hey, party. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of pineapple juice, I'm sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Versace, Versace Mansion. Easy. Oh, baby, we may have to do a tour. <laughs> no, we talk about that offline. <laughs> the other thing, you got some with that though. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. oh baby, yeah. All right, y'all, be All blessed. Right, it's not Club Nine Forty Five. Give me time to get set up. We we stayed on longer. Normally, Shotty be trying to kick me up. Yo, Nine Forty Five. A new record on Market Mondays. All right, y'all, be good. Reach out, call somebody.